Good morning and welcome to today's meeting of the Development Regulation Committee. Can you hear that, Rebecca? Can everyone hear me okay? No. How about now? Now? Is that okay? That's better, I can hear myself, that's the worst bit. Good morning and welcome to today's meeting of the Development and Regulation Committee. I'm Councillor Jenny Theresa and I will be chairing today's meeting. This meeting is being broadcast live and will be available to watch subsequently on the Council's website. Members of the public and the press may record, film, photograph or broadcast this meeting when the public and the press are not lawfully excluded provided due courtesy and respect are shown to others in attendance, in line with the Council's published guidance. We are not expecting a fire drill today. In the event of an alarm sounding, please leave the chamber following the fire exit signs at the rear of the chamber. Fire evacuation instructions can also be found on page three of today's agenda. Can I remind you please to speak clearly into the microphones and avoid placing things such as papers or IT equipment in front of the microphone as this will affect the sound quality on the live broadcast in the chamber. Can I also ask that you turn your mobiles and laptops onto silence please if you have not already done so. Agenda item one, apologies for abstinence and substitutes. Rebecca, do we have any apologies please? Thank you. We've received apologies from Councillor Lance Stanbury, who is substituted by Councillor Elaine Bryce. I've also received apologies from Councillor Kay Oakes. Thank you. Are there any other apologies? No, that moves us on to agenda item two, which is declarations of interest and dispensations. Do members of the committee have any declarations of interest or dispensations, please? Councillor Bryce. Good morning, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'd like to declare an interest in agenda item six um, in my capacity as the local councillor. So I will address the committee as the local member, but I won't take part in the discussion or vote on agenda item six and I'll recuse myself. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other? No, that brings us on to agenda item three, which is the minutes of the previous meeting. Are the members of the committee content to approve the minutes of the last meeting, which was held on the 31st of October this year. Yep, everyone's happy with the minutes. And that moves us on to agenda item four, which is North Farm Barnum. I would like to welcome to the meeting Graham Gumby, National Infrastructure Planning Manager. Before I ask him to introduce the report, I would like to invite Councillor Beer to introduce the site inspection report, which has been tabled on the meeting. Councillor Beer. Thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, yes, members, as you can see, quite a few of us were present at the, la at the site inspection, and, and some of us have been there over the years two or three times, so we are getting quite used, <coughs> quite used to that. But you can see it was a full um, morning there, and uh, we certainly went round the site and um, accessed everything that people wanted us to do. So I think that uh, members can see that there's quite a full report in front of you. Unless there's any questions, um, we'll take it. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Beer. I'll now hand over to Graham to introduce his report. Thank you, Chairman. Let's just go back. Okay, so today we're going to discuss um, two um, applications. One is for the extraction of sand and gravel and subsequent importation of inert waste material to achieve a beneficial restoration um, of the site back to Heathland. This is at Barnum Quarry. And uh, a, a subsequent application, alternative access road, which I'll explain as we go through the slides. So you can see the site there. This is an Ordnance Survey base map of the, of the general location. You can see Thetford to the north. Um, of interest is the A134 which um, travels north-south and then connects to the A11 via uh, road through Thetford. Um, the site itself is the red area, the red line outlined area, and the road it connects to there is the C633, more of that later. So this is uh, zooming in on the site, this is an, uh, uh, um, 
extract from the application. You can see the site area in red there. Um, and there's two little prongs that connect it to the, what is a road to the north of it with the arrows on. The, the one on the right hand side is the access which is proposed in the first application I mentioned. Um, and the one on the left hand side is the one that was subsequently was submitted. Um, the reason why these applications are being discussed together is because um, the access is purely for the quarry and the quarry could only acceptably be accessed via the, of the, the second access application. Um, hopefully I haven't confused you too much with that one. Um, what you can also see on that map in green is the area which is included in the Suffolk Mills and Waste Local Plan. I've got a better map coming up of that. But also what you can see is the proposed lorry route. Lorries would exit the site and travel westward towards the 134 and either north or south on the A134. And to access the site, lorries can only come in off the A11 um, and, uh, along the former stretch of the A11 and then turn left onto the C633 and into the site. So this is an extract from the uh, Suffolk Minerals and Waste Local Plan, which is adopted in 2020. The plan itself went through several rounds of public consultation and an examination in public. The inspector wrote a report recommending uh, minor changes and the county council accepted it as, uh, adopted it as policy in July 2020. Um, you can see the information, you can see the outline of the application area which is marked in orange on this map because at that time and it, it was an existing permission you can see the outline boundary in red which is the proposed um, extension um, which which might come forward in a future application. On that map it's quite useful because it shows the constraints in the area so um, they, they are overlaid so it's slightly patchy but basically the purple area or the mauve area is the special protection area. Um, that's uh, the several bird species um, um, uh, associated with that but possibly most significantly for this application the stone curlew um, which we'll explain a little bit later. You can see the um, um, pentagonal shape to the north. Um, you can, you, um, actually I'll try and point it out. Uh, it's not really going to work. So just to the north of the C633, that's a scheduled monument. That's the former barn and bomb store. Um, and uh, this, you can see Elvedon kind of conservation ex uh, area to the extreme um, left hand side of the slide. Okay, so this is just the Ordnance Survey base map, uh, again slightly zoomed in. And what you can see uh, on the left hand side of the map is there's a, there's a right of way marked, and that's uh, to the west of the site is the Ickneald Way. It's a long distance footpath, but we don't, we don't think it's uh, adversely affected by the proposals. This is an aerial photograph of the site, a recent one. You can show the nat it shows the nature of the site at the moment. Um, generally, the area is a mix of woodland, um, arable agriculture. Um, there's some sheep farming as well on there, but also to the north, you can see um, directly to the north is, is a heathland, which is a national nature reserve. And what you can also see is where the barn and bomb store is. It's, it's, secluded by um, trees. Um, certainly when you go out on site, um, you don't really get um, direct views to and from the site. This is the site as it is at the moment. So what you've got is the green area is a stripped area, the blue area is the existing screen bund. And this is the kind of working scheme for the site. So the, the, the bund would be, further soils would be stripped for the remainder of the site. Topsoil bund uh, is the, the green one and the, the sort of very light yellowy green one, that's the subsoil bund. And the top left hand corner of the site is a plant site area which would include a sand and gravel processing plant and also be associated mobile plant, waybridge and obviously vehicle, vehicles would um, circulate in that area. The blue area is the Silt Lagoon for, um, it's a wet process, gravel processing, so um, the, silt, the silt portion of the, 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 reserve, the resource would be washed out and settled in that lagoon 
and would be used later in the restoration itself. Uh, this is the final um, restoration plan for the site. Um, so the red line area is the, the original application area. You can, you can see the um, subsequent alternative access application in the dashed orange line. And what's interesting here is that you can see that the heathland extends to the north and the south of the red line area. And that would need to be to secure um, establishment and management of that as a heathland, that, that's subject to a unilateral undertaking by the operator and the landowner um, uh, with the county council so that we could enforce that if necessary. So the recommendation is, um, because that legal agreement I've just mentioned isn't signed, is that subject to the completion of the section 106 agreement, permission for both applications be granted subject to the conditions set out in Appendix 1 of the report, um, and also that the Head of Planning be authorised to refuse planning permission in the event that the Section 106 agreement has not been completed within the period of 12 months or any other such agreed timescales as the requirements necessary to make the development acceptable has not been secured for a 106 planning obligation, a draft of which um, is set out in Appendix 2 of the report. And I think... Um, my legal colleague would just want to expand on the section 106. Thanks, Corinne. Um, yeah, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, just on the section 106, we, um, we are aware that there, there is um, an objection t to the uh, remediation works on this land from the, the farmer who, who farms the land there. But um, uh, we have checked the legal position, and I am... Sorry, I am. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me at the back? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I am of the. I'm satisfied that the the landowner um, of the land needed for these remedial works um, under the section 106 holds the superior title to this land um, and is capable of delivering these works through through the 106. So in my view, the farm tenancy will derive its. Um, title from the freeholder and will therefore be bound by this 106. Thank you. Members, do you have any points of clarifications that you'd like to ask Graham, Councillor Stringer? Yeah, please. Uh, is the, I think it was slide 10 I found really useful. Is that, I'd, I'd like to look at that closer. Uh, it's not in the bundle, is it? Can we, uh, slide 9, that's the one. Slide nine, sorry. I was only one out. Is that in the bundle? Because I can't find it. Um, it's, no, this is, that's the written presentation slides. Okay. Right. okay. Sorry, that's the committee. The it's ones that you see in there, that's the committee presentation slides, and I don't believe that one is in the bundle. Okay. Not in the papers, sorry. But obviously, um, there's a link to the application materials. Councillor Beer. Just a clarification, Madam Chairman, um, regarding the 106. That will apply to both applications um, because we're taking the two together. Um, does one have a knock-on effect on the other or not? Um, the, the, the 106 will will apply to the, the land needed for these remediation works. So it, 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 it mitigates the development, so the whole development essentially, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Quinton. That's not in our bundle. The, pit, the, 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 the slide that we've got up there is not in our bundle, is it? The question had already been asked, thank you. Are there any other points of clarification, members? Councillor Stringer? I just want clarification on that drawing. Uh, it's difficult because I'm looking at a distance and the noise aren't as good as they were. The, the green area is a, a mound. So how do, how do you drive up the access if there's a mound in the way? 
So if you, yeah, they're, they're not in the bundle because we, we've got a set format of documents that we submit with applications, yeah, okay. uh, committee reports, and that doesn't include kind of working drawings normally. But in terms of the bund, it's a, yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's an elongated mound um, with sloping sides which would be cultivated. Um, and then if you look at the extreme left-hand side of that, there's a little notch, a little gap between the two buns, and that's where the vehicles would um, enter and egress. So, so, so the driveway on the right-hand side that's inside the red line of the application, that's then being stopped up, is it? No, it's a, that's a line in, a, in an application, and the conditions as written require that the alternative access, the new access, would be the sole means of access to the development. So that's just a, it's a paper line, really. It's not a, but there is, in that area, there is an agricultural access, and that's where we stood on the, on the site visit. But the, I, I, due to comments from, in particular, the tenant farmer, the access has moved to the other end of the site so that it didn't interfere with their operations on the land. Uh, okay, so, so in answer to the question, that access that we walked up at the site visit is then, in theory, being stopped up, is it not? It, it's not stopped up for the farmer, it's, okay. it's, but it's not used for the quarry. So if you recall okay. standing on the site, the, there, is, there is an existing bunce in a similar position to the green bund on that plan, and it's some way into the site. Um, so it's not, it's not stopped up. There's still an agricultural access okay. there, which will remain but it's not for the use of the quarry. Okay, that's all I wanted to clarify, thank you. Councillor Kemp. My question goes back to the legal advice, come on now, thank you, the legal <laughs> advisor. I'm sorry I didn't catch her name, but uh, Corin. Corin, right. Thank you very much. This section 106, as I understand it, what you are telling us, the legal position is, this can be imposed upon a tenant who has got conditions of tenancy and there's no challenge to that implementation. Is that what you're telling us? Thank it, you. Essentially, yes. Um, for, for our purposes, for planning permission here, in order to secure a, a valid Section 106, we must have the superior title sign up to it. And the superior title for this land is the freeholder, and that's the landlord. So we, got, we, we can't consider landlord-tenant issues in this. Um, that's to be decided outside this, this forum. But for the purposes of the Section 106, we have the freeholder on hooked up to it, if you like, and, and that is sufficient for our purposes. Members, do you have... Just to uh, expand upon that, so, it, you know, the contractual situation between tenant and uh, freehold or landlord, whatever you'd like to describe it, the challenge would have to come, if there is a challenge, from the tenant. Is that correct? Yeah, that would be a challenge from the tenant uh, with, to the landlord, with his landlord. Members, do you have any further points of clarification? No, we will now move on to the public participation session and we have received three requests to speak on this item. I would like to invite an objector to the application, Mr Andrew Watson, to come forward to the public speaking table Turn your microphone on and you have five minutes to address the committee. Good morning. Uh, this committee deferred these planning applications on the 31st of October. Yet, remarkably, we are here again Everything is unchanged a mere seven weeks later. In that time, a draft 106 agreement has been drawn up 
but without the agricultural tenant as signatories. This is despite applying to be so via the planning officer. No explanation has been given as to why the tenant isn't a signatory of the 106 agreement, even though it is clear the tenant has a valid claim on the land through a 1986 Agricultural Holdings Act tenancy. There is no agreement in place between the tenant and the landlord regarding this planning application. The adjacent land in question is outside of the planning red line and has no proposed change of use. This is important because the Agricultural Holdings Act allows for a landlord, the Elvedon Estate, to gain possession of land from the tenant for non-agricultural use by serving a Case B notice to quit, where planning permission has been granted within a planning red line. This is uncontestable, incontestable. Land outside of the planning red line, despite being part of the wider restoration plan, does not allow the landlord to serve a valid notice to quit. The landlord has no rightful control over the adjacent land to the north and south of the dig area. The draft 106 agreement does not address this issue and thus serves no useful purpose, as the tenant is neither bound by the planning conditions or the 106 agreement. In order to achieve the restoration plan in full, the agricultural tenants must be included as signatories in the 106 agreement. It is the tenant's consent that is required to enable the restoration of the adjacent land. The tenant is open to enter into negotiations with the landlord, the applicant and the planning authority to ensure that a suitably worded 106 agreement delivers the restoration plan in full. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Members, are there any points of clarification you wish to seek from Mr. Watson? I, I, I wanted to ask, um, really through the solicitor rather than, is this a private matter? Is this, oh, I can see parts of it may not be, but um, surely this is something outside our remit. It is, it? is it, in my view, this is outside uh, planning committee's remit. These are these are land and landlord and tenant issues. As I've said before, as long as we have the superior title, which is the freeholder, signed up to the 106, um, the, the 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 land issues between land and, landlord and tenant are, are not material um, to this uh, to this decision. So, uh, just just to point out that um, I have been informed by the applicant that. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, that the, the actual quarry land was, was obtained from the agricultural tenancy by notice. So the proposition that this cannot be successfully um, done by the landlord is, is evidently not true because he has done it with this land before. Just to point that out. And, and, but frankly, this is not for us to consider here. This is a landlord tenant issue. Um, we, we cannot require the uh, tenant farmer to sign up to the 106, um, but we, we, we can proceed with that 106 knowing that we have the freeholder signed up to it who can, in, and can enforce that 106. So my question would be to the applicant then, um, bearing in mind this advice that has just been given, um, Lots of what you've said we can't take into consideration. Yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that the, the, the dig area, the 14.9, I think there's the map, I think it was in the map 10, Graham. Councillor Stringer? Yeah, I just, just wanted to uh, bottom out. Uh, uh, that's the one. No, the other one. one that's Sorry. it. It's quite clear. The land, the dig area in the red there, was taken back in hand quite properly by the Elvedon Estate uh, under a Section B notice to quit. That's not, we're not contesting that. I've, I've just said that it is incontestable. They had planning permission, fine. They've took that land back in hand. I'm only talking about the two bits of land north and south of that red line. The, the landlord has no control over that. We've got the secure tenancy there. And if 
it's up to us to make sure, or allow us, it's our consent, to uh, allow the restoration plan, which is the big green area, to go ahead. Councillor Stringer? Yeah, just wanted to separate out what or what is not a material consideration. Uh, and it is mildly annoying that we're seven weeks down the line and we don't seem to have gotten, well, we've got a little bit further, but not quite where we want to be. I was led to believe that deliverability, whether this could be implemented or not, is a material consideration. Uh, if it is, then surely we, we need to know that it's implementable. So therefore, the legal niceties are a material consideration and should be in front of us to, to see that it can be implemented. Because if there is the potential that it legally can't come forward, then frankly we're all wasting our time. Uh, the, the legal position is, as I've said, um, that 106 is valid as far as we're concerned. It, it, it is not it, 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 this is not something we can gauge 100% whether, whether any 106 is deliverable, and that's why we have to enforce them sometimes. So, if, if, it, if it isn't deliverable, we, we, will have to, we will have to enforce it, and um, the, the Section 106 will override the, the landlord tenant issues. It, it clearly says on Action 11 that if the Section 106 cannot be completed, then you'll refuse planning permission, yes. not that you will enforce the Section 106. No, but that's a different thing. Um, completing the Section 106 means that the, the freeholder, the land, landlord, will actually um, sign up to the 106 and, and promise covenant to, do, to deliver the works. So we have a, 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 a promise, if you like, in a legal document via a 106. But when we talk about enforcement, this is where the works promised under the 106 are not delivered. We can then enforce this via the courts. E even if there is no legal right to do it? Well, there is a legal right to do it because we will have a completed 106, which will give us the legal right to enforce that contract. If, it, if the works are not delivered, if the, the remediation works are not delivered. Even, even if they're... OK. Yeah, I can see. Councillor Quinton. Thank you, we drive it now. Um, I find the whole thing so far difficult to really understand because we're talking one way and one, one against the other and when you look at the, what we're supposed to be doing at the end of the day, making the decision, I'm going to find it difficult, to be honest with it. And I know my colleagues sitting along here do as well, they're all nodding Have heads. you got um, a point of clarification to the um, objector? Because that's what we're currently on, Councillor Quinton. That might be um, a question for later on. Councillor Kemp? Sorry to dwell on section 106, but I think it is an important situation. Let's put it another way to the legal advisor. We apply the section 106 as we give the permission. What happens if... Um, Madam Chairman, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we are on questions and Councillor Kemp uh, it is questions to the applicant at this stage. I mean, we may have great sympathy with what you're all saying there, but at this stage, it is questions to the applicant. Uh, the, the speaker, sorry. I'm trying to get clarification, Councillor Beer, because I'm, I'm completely confused. Uh, I understand all what the legal advisor has said, but what about the situation? What happens if these agreements are frustrated by a third party. Where do we go from there, please? Um, it, if the 106, the works under the 106 are not delivered, we are then empowered to enforce that agreement against the freeholder of the land. Um, whatever issues that 
freeholder may have with the tenant, the, the Section 106 agreement will override that and, and is enforceable because we have the freeholder of that land signed up to it. It's that simple. Councillor Stringer. Can I just clarify then, on page 75, the red line on that site is not the red line, as it were, of the section 106. The section 106 goes beyond the red line. Is that the, what you're saying? The, the, the section 106 land, if you like, if yeah. I can call it that, is, is the land on which the remediation works are going to be undertaken. And I, I believe that's indicated... Uh, I'm not sure whether it's indicated on that plan. I'll have no, to ask is, Graham. That, I think that's where it's the confusion is, is coming from. Yeah, so it's the green dot around that land is the section 106. But it's the land outside of the red line marked in green. Oh, so sorry, there's a parcel of land to the north and there's a parcel of land to the south. Yeah. Sorry, does that make sense? It's the, it's the green land outside the red line area. That's the 106 land, and that's the, the land that we can enforce against no, with, with our agreement. Yep, yeah, yeah, page 75. Okay. No. Okay. Sorry. Just to say to members that um, if a speaker does raise some points of clarification that we do need legal advice for, then members are allowed to ask legal while the public are in participation, if that helps. Are there any more points of clarification on this? For all? No, thank you very much, Mr Watson, for your time. That now brings us on to Councillor Spicer, who is the local councillor for the Blackbourne Division. Please, can you turn your microphone on and you have five minutes to address the committee when you're ready. Uh, sorry, before you start the clock, um, the, are you going to read the statement from the Parish Council at some point? No, it's just been tabled. Okay, <clears throat> sorry, I, wasn't, I was sort of waiting for that. Well, members, we, here we go again. I tell you, I'm such a sad person. Do you know what I did last night? I watched my speech from six weeks ago and, I, and luckily, your excellent committee clerk has summed it up in the minutes. I was going to talk about the poor old stone curlew, and you are, I remind you, if you were to agree this, you are going against the inspector's advice. I was going to talk about the traffic, because I remind you that the inspector said traffic should not go through the village of Barnum, and yet this application puts it through Station Road and Thetford Road, as well as through Thetford itself. So let's talk about section 106 because I'm pretty uncomfortable with what I've heard this morning. You're quite rightly being told it is not the job of this council or you as a committee to get involved in landlord tenant matters. And yet that's what's happening. You have now been told by your lawyer that the landlord has superior rights. Now that I call legal advice. Frankly, it sounds medieval to go from a landlord having medieval rights over a tenant farmer. <clears throat> so where do we go from here? I actually strongly feel now, I was going to suggest deferring again to get the section 106 properly sorted out, but I think we're, if we're just going to come back month and month, you might be better to consider refusing today, or certainly refusing the application, if not the access road. <clears throat> um, because we're, you're, in, I think, in a very, very difficult position now from the questions that have been raised and most seriously from the answers given. To be absolutely clear, the tenant farmer is not, there's, there's no question that, that the landowner has the right within the red line to, to quarry. He has planning permission from you, from us already, and has reached the, done the correct legal process. What we're talking about was the green area, which is the Heathland area. I don't understand how you can have a situation in the recommendations, uh, paragraphs 10 and 11, that if it's not completed within 12 months, surely you want to know it's completed now, before you give permission. And all this talk of enforcement further down the line, um, I mean, one of the things 
I put to you today, you could ask officers in your recommendations that this comes back to you, just the section 106, if agreement is reached with the tenant farmer. But frankly, the section 106 that you've got in front of you cannot be delivered unless the tenant farmer agrees. Um, now, there may be ways to get him to agree, but you have, you've been, you're not being told that now. So, I was going to talk about stone curlews. You know my favourite subject. Um, but I think my time is probably nearly up. You've got a hundred and something pages here. You've got a lot more traffic information. I just urge you today, and I'm, you know, I say it with a heavy heart, I think rather than defer for further information about this section 106 problem, it might be safer for this council to refuse it because I think you are now in danger of getting involved in a landlord-tenant matter by talking about the superior authority. Superior, yes, that was the words, wasn't it? Um, so thank you, Chairman, for letting me come yet again. I said, 10 years to the day we first had a planning application for this site. Many of you were, few of you were around then. Um, thank you to those of you that have been on the site visit. But for those of you that haven't, you've missed a jolly nice part of Suffolk. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Spicer. Members, are there any points of clarification that you would ask, like to ask Councillor Spicer? No. Oh, Councillor Beer. Well, yes, Madam Chairman. Um, listening to what Councillor Spicer has just said, is the advice still sound that our legal advisor has given us that we can go ahead and make a decision one way or the other? Um, and uh, accepting that the 106 would or wouldn't come into effect? Uh, because, you know, Councillor Spice made some valid points, but we were told before she spoke that this, was, um, th this wasn't within our gift. So I, I just want that clarification again. Would you like me to clarify that, uh, Councillor Vitt? Yeah. J j just to say that um, you do have the power to make the decision today um, uh, on the basis that the, one, the 106 agreement that has been put forward is valid, can be enforced because we have all the requisite parties signed up to it. We do not need to have the tenant farmer to sign up to this 106 to make it valid. Um, it, it's a technicality. It doesn't feel right, I know that, but it, it, technically it's correct. We have the freeholder of the land signed up to the 106. So uh, the 106 is valid, it's enforceable, and it will, if it's not completed, i.e. signed off by the landlord, within a year, then permission, planning permission will be refused. Are there any other points of clarification, members? No. That then brings us on to the applicant, Mr. John Gu. You have five minutes to address the committee when you're ready. Thank you. Chair, members of the committee. Some six weeks ago, I addressed this committee pointing out the clarity of the officer's report relating to the two developments at North Farm site. That report contained recommendations for, for approval of both applications. Today, you have before you an equally clear officer report repeating the recommendation to approve the scheme that would extract some 400,000 tonnes of essential mineral. Last time I addressed this committee, I listed the vast number of statutory consultees dealing with technical issues that raised no objection to the application. Those consultees ranged from the Environment Agency, your County Ecologist, Natural England, RSPB, and the County Highway Authorities of Suffolk and Norfolk. The determination of the application on the 31st of October was deferred for three counts. The first was that relating to the Breckland SPA and the potential impacts on the stone curlew. This is fully addressed in Annex 1 of the report that, which contains a formal appropriate assessment undertaken by your own county ecologist and importantly endorsed by Natural England as the national advisor on such matters. This sets out restrictions as to when soil stripping operations can commence 
so as not to disturb the stone curlew within or immediately adjacent to the site. The second point relates to the increase in HTV traffic along the C633. The eastbound route of this road is identified as an acknowledged part of Suffolk strategic lorry route network. The additional four HGVs per hour are relatively low and equates to less than 2.5% increase in traffic movements and is well, well within the typical daily variations of movements. As noted back in October, your own County Highways Authority have raised no objection to this route being used. I would also like to re-emphasise the HGV route does not pass through the village core of Barnum. The third point relates to the provision of a legally binding agreement to establish over 11 hectares of heathland to the north and south of the mineral extraction area, consistent with what was previously consented by this authority. The applicant, the, the landowner, have prepared a draft planning obligation by way of a unilateral undertaking in favour of Suffolk County Council, as requested by members at the last meeting. This requires a Heathland rehabilitation scheme to be submitted for approval within 12 months of commencement of the project for the creation and subsequent aftercare of that land for which it will benefit the Stone Curlew. The approved scheme will then be implemented at the same time as the restoration of the mineral extraction site. The Heathland to be created outside the red area, and being discussed this morning, is identical to that previously granted by this authority several years ago. To that end, I'll refer you back to this infamous slide, slide 10, which reflects the consented scheme for the Borofit application. As noted at the last committee meeting in October and reaffirmed in the officer report today, the application does not conflict with your up-to-date minerals and waste local plan, does not conflict with the West Suffolk local development framework, does not conflict with policy objectives of the national planning policy framework. Given the above, your officers have quite rightly recommended approval of the two applications as governmental advice is clear that apart from exceptional circumstances, applications that accord with the development plan should be approved without undue delay. The planning conditions will be imposed by your authority will protect local amenity. The planning conditions imposed by your authority will protect designated wildlife sites and designated species. The restoration scheme as a whole will provide a very positive contribution to biodiversity net gain to land within the Breckland Special Protection Area and is wholly consistent with the objectives of the Central Government's Environment Act, which will be fully implemented next year. We therefore ask you follow, that you follow the advice of your professionally qualified planning officers to approve the development today. Chair and members, thank you. Thank you, Mr Goff. Members. Do you have any points of clarification you'd like to ask, Councillor Stringer? Could, could I just go back to the how many lorries an hour, please? Certainly. In ter terms of an hour, that's four HGVs leaving the site per hour. Four per hour. Yes. And that's in the agreement, is it? No, that's no, that's in what the application is. There's no actual. Re that's an average during the day. Thank you. Councillor Kemp. Right, thank you. Would you kindly repeat uh, the statement you made in relation to the Wildlife Trust, please? Sorry, the Wildlife Trust? Well, I understood you to say there was no objections from anybody to deal with wildlife. No. no I said there's no, no, no objections from statutory bodies dealing with technical issues. You have seen the report, have you? Page 26. 80, I, I agree that the Wildlife Trust... 81. The, one, the, the two Wildlife Trusts are uh, objecting on, on air quality issues, but importantly, Natural England, who are the national body, are not objecting. Are there any further points? Councillor Sower? Um, in, in general, I have a question in general. The quarry business in the United Kingdom, do you think it's something, do have quarries over the last 20 years more closed or more opened up? What do you mean? From what, your experience. What do you mean by closed or opened up? Is it an increase in In, in, in business or is it less? I, I would have said in, in terms of 
the, the applicant company, the, the production is certainly, uh, I've worked for the company for over 20 years, and that, that the output has certainly increased from that, from that sector, yes. Nationally, I suspect the output is, um, is fairly regular. COVID, COVID obviously affected uh, outputs of certain manufacturers. Thank you. Members, do you have any other points of clarification on the speakers? Councillor Beer? Uh, yes. Um, so I heard you comment on all the people who are not objecting. What is your comments regarding the objector earlier, uh, the tenant farmer uh, comments? Um, how would you answer that to us? I know it's a bit difficult, but well, we are in a difficult yes, situation. This, as has been said several times this morning, this is an issue between the, the landowners, the Albany estate, and their tenant farmer. Uh, and the, uh, the issue will be addressed through, through notices served under the Agricultural Holdings Act. But uh, as the applicant, we are not directly involved in those discussions or, or notices being served. There don't seem to be any further hands, so thank you very much for your time, Mr. Goff. Thank you. I'd now would like to open the debate. Who would like to go first? Councillor Goldsmith. I'm just taking that out because it echoes. <laughs> um, I'm still a little bit concerned about this 106 agreement. I've been set on planning committees for over 20 years with the borough. And I've never come across what has been said about a 106 agreement. If we, it appears to me what is being said, that this council will enforce something which, to me, is a civil matter rather than our, us. Why, why are we enforcing a 106 agreement? Um, we say it's between the owners of the land and the tenant farmer. So why are we, as a council, getting you involved? That, that is the way I'm looking at it, the way it's been said. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you mean by why are we getting involved, um, because the, the purpose of that 106 is to, to mitigate the development, which is the quarry. Um, now, the, you need to be satisfied that the, the mitigation um, is, is legally enforceable via a 106 agreement so so that's been produced and it's a valid 106 agreement we have the we have the requisite uh, freeholder of the land signing up to that agreement um, so I'm not I'm not sure what you mean by uh, so the way, the way that I look at if for any reason the owner cannot get an agreement with the tenant how is that enforced? That, that's a matter for the landlord and tenant. Uh, we, we can enforce the section 106 because we have the requisite landowner signed up to the 106. So we can enforce that. That's, that's, that's all that we are concerned with here is that we can enforce the 106 agreement and it, it's a valid agreement. That any landlord and uh, tenant issues outside of that, we cannot possibly consider because we are, you know, we're not the forum to consider it, and we we certainly don't know what they are. Are there any other members, Councillor Sower? Um, thank you very much for all the explanations. I believe we can go with recommendations as the um, section 106 is quite powerful. It's not something where we think, oh my goodness, we can't enforce it. We can as a county council and I'm quite happy to go with the recommendations. There is a business, they have employees, they want to ex increase their business. I, I really think we have to support them. And um, I must say, although I understand that the traffic is a nasty bit of for anybody, but traffic is, I, I'm sorry to say, but nowadays traffic is part of life. And it's better to bring prosperity to Suffolk with businesses than 
to say, oh no, we want to keep all the traffic out and we do not allow any, any businesses to prosper and to inc um, increase their, their activities. So I'm quite happy to go with the recommendations. Thank you. Is that a proposal, Councillor Sower? Thank you. Is there a seconder? Councillor Beer? Yes, Madam Chair, reluctantly I was second it. I don't think we've any other course of action. We've been told by the legal uh, experts that this is enforceable. Uh, it will come into effect in 12 months' time. Um, and if it fails, then it, uh, we're back to square one. So I, 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 I can't see that we can keep deferring this or, or refusing it or sending it back and forwards. Um, I think we need to make a stand and um, uh, go along with it. Uh, officers have uh, supported this. They feel confident with it. Uh, our legal people are confident with it. I think we've got to accept it, so I, I do second it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members that would like to enter the debate? Councillor Stringer? Yeah, I, I still think we perhaps could have uh, indulged in a slightly different recommendation. I think. If, I know we can't delve into private rights, but if there are private rights which stop a sustainable Section 106 being able to be signed, that's not later challenged and found to be wanting, uh, we could be in a whole heap of trouble because we could have approved something where the mitigation then can't be enforced. Because uh, 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 I feel worried about the language that even if it, it, we're suggesting that if it was later proved that the, the superior title didn't have the legal right to enforce against the private right, then we would enforce that. Really? I, I don't think we would. I think we'd be in a whole heap of legal trouble. I think what we were expecting to do was the deferment would be flush that out. And frankly, it hasn't. It's flushed out that someone has superior title. I bet we do. But superior title only means that. It doesn't mean you can actually do it. Uh, so I, I would have liked to have seen a recommendation that we were minded to approve, subject to seeing that signed Section 106. So then that legal challenge, if it was going to come from a third party, could have then been had, and we'd have known the outcome. So until I see that, I can't support this application. Uh, can, I, can I just make a comment on that, uh, Councillor Stringer? Um, I think what you have to remember is that we do have a valid 106. It, it is enforceable. Um, we, we cannot, we, we're not here to determine what might happen in the future on, on legal landlord and tenant issues. But for the purposes of the planning decision, we have a valid enforceable section 106 because we have the requisite parties signed up to that. I see no further hands, and we have a proposal by Count, oh, Councillor Kemp. Uh, I'll just make a note of, for the record. I, I will not be supporting this because, to me, it's almost back to the courtroom where you dealt with defendants and you set them up to fail. And to me, this decision, if we go ahead, is set up to fail. So I'm sorry, I cannot support it. We have a proposal for acceptance from Councillor Sower, seconded by Councillor Beer, and that is to approve the officer's recommendation that subject to the completion of the Section 106 agreement, permission for both applications be granted subject to the conditions set out in Appendix 1 of this report, that the Head of Planning be authorised to refuse planning permission in the event that the Section 106 agreement has not been completed within the period of 12 months or any other such agreed timescales as the requirements necessary to make the development acceptable has not been secured through a Section 106 planning obligation, a draft of which is set out in Appendix 2 of the report. All those in favour? Against? That application has been refused. Um, 
reasons for refusal here. It, it is the material reason, as I'm reading it at the moment, that we do not have a, a, a valid Section 106 and that we, we are saying that because of future legal challenges under the Landlord and Ten well, under, under the Tenancy Acts, Agricultural Tenancy Acts, we are refusing. I have a point of order. I don't believe we've refused. No, sorry, I need to find, I need to find a proposal oh. for a refusal. So I need a proposal and a seconder for a refusal I, I would be or a deferral. I would be content to propose that we are minded to approve, subject to seeing that signed Section 106 agreement. Yeah, that's fine. I'd need a seconder for your proposal, Councillor Stringer. Councillor Kemp. So I just say that the it stays it stays the same as what's written in the report apart from the additional that we are minded to approve subject to the 106. Mm. Seeing it. Yep. So all those in favour? But I don't understand where we're at now. So, I'm voting it. A, a, Approval. Has the 106 been signed or not signed? No, but we're, um, Councillor Stringer has asked that he would like to vote um, with the, what the officers have already put, apart from just the slight tweaking of the word, that we are minded to approve, subject to seeing the signed Section 106 agreement. So why can't that be signed? Why can't we defer until it is signed? But we're not. The, the committee can defer. Um, however, we have um, a proposal for the changing of the words by Councillor Stringer, which can is I, seconded sorry, by can Councillor I, Kemp. Can I just come in on the, the 106 and the signing of it? Mm -hmm. um, it, it is in its uh, agreed form at the moment. We have accepted it in its form. So the form you have is the, the, the form of uh, undertaking that will be signed. Um, this this won't change, um, certainly not materially. So I'm not sure why committee would like to see the uh, signed section 106. But if, if that's that's the ask, then we, we can do that. We can um, come back to committee with a signed agreement, but it will be materially no different to the one you have in front of you. We have a proposal and a second, uh, unless anybody else has got any other comments. Councillor Beer? Well, I'd like to know what the Chief Planning Officer's um, comments and views are at this late stage. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's workable. I'm confused like Councillor Harsett. So if I, I can, I can summarise the position that, that um, or the motion that has been put forward that the, the, the Section 106 is, is, is signed. Um, you've, you've heard from the legal advisor that it's not going to be any material difference to the document apart from signatures. Um, I would expect if I were the developer, without a resolution from this committee to grant planning permission, I would not be signing a Section 106. So, so it, it, we, we would end up in possibly a bit of a circular um, state of affairs. Councillor Quinton. Thank you, Chair. Sorry to be a pain, but I thought we'd had a vote on this, yeah. and then we're going to have another vote on something different, unless I'm... The, the vote was lost for the proposal of the vote was lost for the proposal of the acceptance as done but we haven't actually had a vote to refuse it or defer it or to make any amendments so we need to vote until we've got a final position on it 
but we have a proposal by Councillor Stringer, seconded by Councillor Kemp. I don't know if anybody else wants to come in into the debate. Madam Chairman, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there's uh, discussions going on between members. Certain members have left the meeting during this debate. Um, I really don't know where we are at this moment. Um, I think that the member you're referring to, Councillor Beer, isn't actually on the committee. So all members of the committee have My apologies to you. Sorry. <laughs> Good observation. Um, so we have a proposer and a seconder for the slight word change of what the officers have written, and that is that we're minded to approve subject to seeing the signed 106 agreement. All those in favour? Well, it's what Councillor Stringer proposed. Yeah, I'll ask Rebecca to read it for us again. Hello, the proposal on the table is the committee is minded to approve subject to seeing a signed version of the section 106 agreement to that planning permission for both applications be granted subject to the conditions in appendix one and that the Head of Planning be authorised to refuse planning permission if, in the event that the Section 106 has not been completed within the period of 12 months, or any other such agreed, agreed timescales as the requirements nece necessary to make the development acceptable has not been secured through a Section 106 planning obligation, a draft of which is available and set out in Appendix 2. So that's paragraphs 10 and 11 of your report. The difference is the committee is minded to approve subject to seeing a signed section 106 agreement. Councillor Drummond. Thank you. I, I think that proposal doesn't make sense. You can't give 12 months to see something if you can't do it unless you've signed it. So it doesn't it just doesn't make sense what you've just read out. Okay, I, I think uh, what we're doing here is we're saying the, the original um, officer's report has, has recommended that planning permission is uh, granted subject to a completed section 106. Now, on completion of that 106, permission would be granted on that basis. So what you're saying here is you're, you're actually changing uh, the officer approval of that section 106 you're actually changing it to committee to decide on that 106 <clears throat> i think essentially that's what it is um and and they have a year in which to to sign up to that 106. I'm sorry madam chairman um, on on this point about the 12 months that is no longer necessary if there has been a signature yeah yeah, Sorry. exactly. 
I'm going to make a proposal from the chair as well, which um, I don't know if anybody would second me, but again, we'd have to go through Councillor Stringer's vote first unless it gets withdrawn, and that we accept the report as is, but add on the addition at the bottom um, that we bring it back to committee after it's been signed and completed so that the members just have an update report so that it's as the officers read. Yeah, it's just as how we word it slightly different, I think. Are you happy with that? I mean, that is exactly what I thought we'd done. If you are, if we are minded to approve, subject to seeing, well, how do we see it if we don't have a committee meeting to see it? So, I, th I thought that was implicit in the recommendation, but happy to include that if you wish. We can make amendments, but we um, we refused it as currently what was written, Councillor Harson. So we can make amendments to it. Councillor Stringer, <laughs> it's, I know it's getting a bit confusing, members. Um, I was removing what you would suggested that we're minded to prove subject to seeing the signed version, and it was going with the officer's word in, but then just adding at the end that just to bring bring it back to committee if it has been signed and completed just for an update. No, we want it brought back anyway. I think was my feeling. Uh, I'm happy to withdraw if, if you, well, I shouldn't, no, because I've, I've put a valid motion and we should debate it and vote on it. Uh, and, and if there's another, we shouldn't technically have two motions on the table at the same time, because that's very confusing. Uh, so if, if members don't like the minded to approve, subject to seeing the section signed 106, refuse it if the committee wants, and then there's another proposal. That's, that's I believe, how it should work. Sorry to be confusing. Uh, so we have a proposer, which Rebecca has read out the word in for Councillor Stringer's proposed and seconded by Councillor Kemp. All those in favour? Thanks. Councillor Drummond? May I propose refusal, please? Thank you. Based on the traffic issues that have um, been brought up by a number of object objectors. So, what was your reason? Based on the traffic objections that have been brought up by a number of people, um, Councillor Spicer, over the page, um, the uh, Bar and Parish Council, the objectors that are listed in 86. And do we have a seconder for refusal? Councillor Bryce? Any other members? To debate, Councillor Beer? Uh, well, well, yes, that, that's obviously a valid proposal and what have you. So, you, you're um, recommending refusal on highway grounds. Can we ask what the highways, um, uh, I mean, going through the report, the highways were reasonably happy with all this. So, um, I, I need to know how we can refuse it on something when our experts, whether we agree with experts or not, uh, are telling us that it's acceptable. So, could the planning officers or somebody please? I'll tend to agree if you can, Slip here. So, so, can I get an answer to how can we argue this when our experts are telling us? I'd like to hear from the um, um, officer Grumby if he can just comment what he said. Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, obviously, the officers have uh, recommendations for approval, and we've got no objection for either Suffolk or Norfolk Highways authorities. So I don't know. An appeal, Madam Chairman. I mean, um, if they go to an appeal, that that's that would be taken into consideration. So I don't know where we go from here. 
only thing I can ask is that, um, James, have you a reason, a material reason, why this would be refused, which would stand up in appeal? Um, I would quite like to, um, to be able to discuss with Councillor Drummond, and perhaps we could adjourn so I could form um, um, a, a, a reason for refusal um, that Councillor Drummond might wish to um, table. How, how long an adjournment would you need? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So if we come back here at half past 11, members, please.
Welcome back, members. So just for a quick update, we have a refusal on the table which was proposed by Councillor Drummond and second by Councillor Bryce. I will just hand over to the Head of Planning to come up with the wording, please. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, before I read out the, the precise wordings of the reason for refusal, without highways um, uh, officers' um, uh, concurrence with this reason, it would be very hard for us to defend an appeal. Uh, that said, um, I've, I've agreed the following um, with, with Councillor Drummond, um, that planning permission be refused because the application would generate potentially significant adverse impacts through additional levels of heavy goods vehicle movements along the Elverdon Road, brackets C633, close brackets, and through Thetford along the A134, contrary to policy GP4 of the Suffolk Minerals and Waste Local Plan 2020. Thank you. Councillor Stringer. Yeah, I'd, I'd, if it's OK, I'd like to speak to that recommendation. Uh, I, I don't think that is substantial enough reason to vote for refusal and I'll explain why. Given the amount of material in the quarry and the average amount of traffic at 32 vehicles a day, that's 500 days in total. 32 trucks a day. We don't have any advice to say that that road network cannot sustain that. And that would be, the bar for highways objection is, quote, severe uh, in government legislation. Severe normally means you've got to prove someone's going to be injured. <laughs> it, it, it's a very, very high bar. Uh, and I think 32 extra HGV movements a day in that area is not a high bar. Uh, we travelled that road network. Yes, it goes past some houses. Yes, it goes past some houses. Uh, but so do all the other lorries and the HGVs and the agricultural traffic in that area goes past. So appealing as it might be to refuse this application, uh, I don't think I can vote to refuse it just based on highways grounds that I don't believe hit the government threshold of being severe. Thank you. Councillor Beer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, well, I understand where the Chief Plan Officer has come from. He's trying to help solve this problem. But could I just ask, in your professional opinion, that if this went to an appeal and you had to uh, attend the appeal and stand up for the highways and you were asked the question, um, do you support, in your professional opinion, that this... Um, is against the highways um, recommendation, you could actually stand there and do that, or sit there and do that. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, the policy GP4 um, um, talks about potentially significant adverse impacts. Um, we would have to be identifying what those significant adverse impacts are in order to defend the appeal. Um, and um, as both um, Norfolk County Council and Suffolk County Council Highway Authorities have not raised an objection and only recommend conditions. We wouldn't be able to demonstrate those significant adverse impacts um, and, and, uh, according to the, the, the highway specification. So that it, we, we would be defending the appeal essentially on, on the, on the um, objections of local residents and, and parish council. So that puts you in a very difficult position but you would defend it on the parish and the local residents. Thank you. Councillor Bryce. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr Cutting, just point of clarification. Have highways, either Norfolk or Suffolk highways, made an on-the-ground visit, or has it been an assessment remotely of the impact or potential impact on the ground? Certainly, uh, I didn't meet with Norfolk officers, but certainly Suffolk officers, we, we had been, had, have been out there, I can confirm that. Um, but, but obviously the Norfolk officers and the Suffolk officers have got prior knowledge of the ongoing issues, and, and, and obviously in respect to Thetford, that would be the Norfolk officers, and, and I think they're, they're um, you know, I don't want to sort of overrun your question, but basically, you know, it's, it's as councillor, Stringer says, you know, in terms of the impacts, but yeah, they're at that level. Low. Thank you. Uh, 
Are there any other members that would like to enter the debate? No, so we have in front of us a refusal from Councillor Drummond, seconded by Councillor Bryce. All those in favour of refusal? Against? So that has failed, members. So members, we're still in a position as that was um, that vote was lost, that we still haven't come to a res resolution on this item. Um, I'm going to propose from the chair a recommendation, and that is subject to the completion of the section 106 agreement and production of this at committee, permissions for both applications be granted subject to the conditions set out in appendix one of this report that the Head of Planning be authorised to refuse planning permission in the event that the Section 106 agreement has not been completed within the period of 12 months or any other such agreed timescales as the requirements necessary to make the development acceptable has not been secured through a Section 106 planning obligation, a draft of which is set out in Appendix 2 of this report. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Cloak? I'm happy to second that, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Would anybody like to enter the debate? Councillor Stringer? Just a point of clarification. Uh, it then says within that recommendation that it be granted. Uh, is that before or after the section completed 106 comes to the committee? Uh, that, that will be on production of the uh, signed 106. So, that so, that is that so if the signed section 106 comes in prior to the committee, is it then approved before the committee see it? Then it, the, the committee uh, can, you know, sub so in other words, permission is granted subject to the approval of the signed section 106. By the committee? By no. the committee, okay. rather than the planning officer. No, I'd like to see that here. Thank you. Councillor Drummond. Thank you very much. I, I can't actually see the difference in what you've said between the first proposal that failed and the second proposal that failed. Can you just explain what the difference is in what you've proposed there to what's already failed on the table? Thank you. I, I think the difference was that in, instead of the planning officer um, receiving the completed section 106 and then uh, Grant, you know, permission would be, uh, planning permission would be granted. Um, we're we're bringing it to committee because committee have asked for the completed section 106 to be given before planning permission is gra is is granted. But that's what Councillor Springer suggested, and that failed. I don't think he did. Um, Madam, Madam Chairman, I, yes, Councillor Baird. Um, if if we went along with that and um, the proposal, and that that was uh, agreed, why does it need to come back to the committee if if they've all agreed to it and the chief planning officer sees it, he can okay it and sign it off. Why has it got to come to us? to say what are we going to see and all we're going to do is exactly what the chief planning officer would have done. I, I, I can't see the distinction there, which is what I think Councillor Stringer said much earlier on in the meeting. Councillor Quinton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, 
it, it concerns me the longer we sit, no disrespect to anybody here, it concerns me the longer we sit here debating this particular item, because if in future anything else, else whenever it might be, happens, a similar decision to what we've made today happens, we could go on and on and on until we come to an agreement. I, to me, it's, are we making a ride for our own back here? Because it just it doesn't seem right to me. And I've just built me coffee. James. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, could, I, could I just clarify uh, with you, Madam Chairman, that your proposal is as the officer's recommendation in, on page 18? Um, it's just the wording is slightly changed. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, could you cl clarify which of the, how, how the wording's chair, yeah. changed? Because um, I didn't quite follow that. That subject to the completion of the Section 106C6 agreement and production of this Act Committee, permissions for both applications be granted subject to the conditions set out in Appendix 1 of the report, and then Paragraph 2 stays the same. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Councillor Drummond. I, I, I still feel that what's on the table now is so similar to what has failed. I would ask you maybe to withdraw that proposal and I'll put a proposal that we actually defer this to give the officers to come the opportunity to come back with something slightly different to put for, in front of us again, um, where there'll be more clarity, I feel. We can't, uh, sorry, Madam Chairman, we can't ask the officers to come back with a reason to refuse or approve something when they've already given their professional opinion at this stage. We have to tell them, I think, more than anything else. And as you can see, it's getting very difficult because um, all the experts are sound different to what certain members want from this side. Councillor Kemp. Well, I think, Madam Chairman, the benefit of the proposal you have put forward, wearing the applicant's hat, it's beneficial because the applicant will know exactly where he stands and he can proceed to get everything in place. Thank you. Would anybody else like to enter the debate? Councillor Stringer. But can I just check? I don't want to prolong this, but I, I'm struggling to see how this motion differs from the first motion which failed. I think the thing there that would happen, Councillor Stringer, yeah. is that you were mind, we were minded to approve where this one would be that once it's complete that it just brings it back to committee for us all to see that this has been completed. Yeah. So it's just a, basically a, a report but, to us but, to show but, that it's yeah, been done. So, so it would be post its approval. It would be after it's already been approved. It, it's because the recommendation says that we approve it on receipt of the signed section 106. Yes. What I think the committee, what, what I certainly want to see, and that failed as well, I wanted to see the signed section 106 before any approval was given. Yeah, sorry, if I just come in. I think, yeah, there is a technical issue here in which the proposal at the moment is saying um, subject to the Section 106 agreement, it's approved, but it's got to come back to committee. Well, that's almost going around in circles because it's, it would be coming back to committee when it's been approved, and then, you know, what's the committee meant to do? Um, what it would be is that it would be an information bulletin so that members of the committee would know that, that either the Section 106 has been agreed or if it doesn't, it doesn't come back. As um, if the Section 106 isn't agreed, um, then the other paragraph is that um, planning permission is refused. Chair, Chair, can I help? I, I, I think the reluctance certainly on my part is a Section 106 coming back to a committee makes that Section 106 a public document. So if there is a third party legal issue there, 
that can be flushed out and at least aired so we know that we can be assured that this is deliverable. I think that is where the rub is and certainly what I was trying to seek with the earlier motion that then didn't succeed. Here is that point that if we agree that a section 106 can be uh, drawn up and, and signed, it's between two parties. And if there is a legal issue that might m make that undeliverable in the future, it's not able to be aired. But if it comes back to committee, it becomes a public document. And I think it's that double check that I certainly wanted, felt more comfortable with, and why I was rejecting ones that didn't. Yeah. Can I, can I just clarify there that, that the agreement you have, the draft agreement, the draft undertaking, um, it, it won't materially change when it's completed. And it, but but we, we have to have the completed undertaking before we can grant permission. Because if we don't have it completed, we don't have a, we don't have a, a legal agreement. And, and, it, and it is in the public domain then. Um, so whether committee looks at that and says this is completed, or the planning officer looks at that and says this is completed, there is, there is no difference. Um, any, anything that, com that comes to light, uh, I can't think what would come to light personally, because as I've said to you, the, one, the 106 agreement has the, has the necessary uh, people signed up to it. Um, you have the applicant and you have the freeholder giving this undertaking. It, it's not actually going to be signed by the council because we're not a party to it. What it is, if you like, is an undertaking. It's a, un, a, a unilateral undertaking by one, uh, two parties and they're promising us that in a legal document that they will carry out the remedial works. Now, it's not for us to decide whether they can do it because they may have landlord and tenant issues because we cannot possibly decide on that or know that. Uh, uh, at this point, we can only say this is a valid um, Section 106 unilateral undertaking for our purposes for, in order to determine planning permission. We, we can't ask for any more, so the, the agreement will not change one year down the track. They may possibly be able to get the tenant farmer to sign up to the unilat to the 106 agreement. That would be, you know, better for, for the committee, obviously. Um, but technically, they don't need to have the tenant farmer si sign up to the agreement. So technically, we have a valid, enforceable section 106. Madam Chairman. Uh, yeah, sorry, if I could just come in and make a suggestion. Would, would it, um, it would be subject to you amending your proposal, would it be acceptable that, um, that, it, that permission is granted subject to the section 106 and the signed section 106 being, being presented to the chair and vice chair of the committee? Madam um, Chairman, if, if that's fine and favour, it's coming back to very similar to what was proposed originally by um, myself and my colleague there, that we could add that point if that would be sufficient. Um, that picks up Councillor Stringer's uh, point, I think, um, and I'd be quite happy to propose that if, if that was the case. Councillor Sower? Just for clarification, the document which will be signed under the section 106 will be in the public domain? Yes, that's correct. And once it's signed, it's possible to view it? Absolutely, yes. So it's not behind closed door, doors? So, so on what, this is the, the nub, so the draft section 106, wh where is that then accessible? That, that would be with your bundle of um, papers. Yeah, only because it's coming to committee. 
So yeah. if, it's, if, if, if it's going to be shown to chair and vice chair, that's not in a, that's, that's not in a public domain. That's not in, it's only in the public domain after it's signed. In that circumstance. The, the that's correct. It's correct. in the public domain when it's signed. Once it's signed. Yes. That's the point. Yes. I want to see it signed uh, bef before it's signed in the public domain. You want to see it when it's signed Sorry. in the public it, yeah. it, that, That's exactly two. what happens. Before we allow the permission to go ahead. Appendix 2. The draft version is already in. in I know there's a draft, appendix. it's not been signed. And it is only now in the public domain, as of a week ago, the draft. Yes. So if it, was, if it wasn't legally enforceable, third parties have only been able to see it for a week. That's my point. Um, but, but that it is legally enforceable. Okay. We've accepted that it's legal, legally enforceable. We might have accepted that. In its draft form, we're happy that it's a legally enforceable section 106. So, and we're so, saying uh, uh, what's, what's put forward in front of committee today is this is a legally enforceable section 106 grant planning permission on the basis uh, uh, planning permission would be granted subject to the completion of this agreement. So in other words, planning permission will not be granted if, a section one, if the section 106 is not signed and put into the public domain. <coughs> Councillor Bryce. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think for me, the, the, the clarity has come forward a little bit more from Corin on the previous point just made, not just the immediately um, proceeding. Um, and, and maybe this is appropriate or not, because I appreciate that within the, the remit of this committee, what we can and cannot decide on and make our decisions on. But I think the issue that Corin touched on, which was very helpful, and I think certainly for myself, I won't put words into the mouths of other committee members, but I think there is that issue of the tenant farmer not being part of this and being done to, not done with. Um, and I appreciate that that's not something we can vote on, but I thank Corin for raising that point. And if there is a way that that can be um, brought in, I would certainly feel much more comfortable in my decision making. Thank you. Just, just, to, just to clarify that, Councillor Bryce, um, it, uh, uh, it would be uh, perfect if the tenant farmer signed up to the section 106 agreement as well but legally we don't need him to we don't re and we, we can't require him to do that and as i uh, as it's a, a less of a title than the freehold he the tenant farmer will will be bound by that section 106 agreement whether whether he he, he likes that or not because it it binds people it binds parties who derive title from the freeholder? Councillor Sower. No, not anymore. Thank you. Are there any other members that would like to enter the debate? So, members, we have my proposal. Councillor Kemp, did you want to come in on debate? Oh, sorry, Councillor Quinton. Thank you, Chair. I will say it again. Are we in danger of setting a precedent here? Because we've, we've made the, the committee has voted on something, made a decision, whichever way around it is. Are we in danger of setting a precedent? I.e., if in a couple of two or three metres time, we have a similar situation, are we in danger of having to go through all this again? Because I've been on planning committees, as most of my colleagues have, for many, many years, and I've never known anything like this before. The vote was lost. The, the vote was lost on what we've voted on so far, and 
any members can make amendments, which I have made an amendment, which then needs a vote, which I've proposed it and Councillor Cloak has seconded. So we'll just need a vote on that. Are you, are you clear on what the amendment was? I, I understand where you're coming from, Chair, but well, are we in danger of this happening again and again and again? Well, I, I can't predict the future, unfortunately. So what we're voting on is that subject to the completion of Section 106 agreement and production of this Act Committee, permissions for both applications be granted subject to the conditions set out in Appendix 1 of this report and that the Head of Planning be authorised to refuse permission in the event that the Section 106 agreement has not been completed within the period of 12 months or any other such agreed timescales as the requirements necessary to make the development acceptable has not been secured through a Section 106 planning obligation a draft of which is set out in Appendix 2 of this report. Well, I'm sure that sounded very similar to what my colleague and I put forward first, but uh, I'm happy to go along with it. It's the amendment. So I just, all those in favour? Uh, oh, Councillor Kemp. Uh, I think we're all conscious that this thing has gone round and round the mulberry bush for a long time now. Uh, does it specifically have to be 12 months, or could it be a shorter period? I think shorter periods might address people's minds to the problems. Yeah, that, that, it can be shorter. There's no, there's no uh, restriction on time. No. I would have suggested that six months was adequate, personally. But, uh... Councillor Bryce. Sorry, it was just a quick question. I thought Mr Cutting already said that we could reduce that period of 12 months. The 12 months was irrespective. Or was that relating to another point? I just want a clarification on that. Thank you. Sorry, croaking. Yes, the committee can um, change the, the, the period for uh, the refusal if the Section 106 isn't signed. It can be 12 months, 6 months, could even be, even be 3 months. It's a reasonable period for a, a Section 106 to be, to be agreed. You have a, a detailed draft Section 106 in front of you. Um, I, I, if the um, landowner and the applicant are, are, are willing to sign a copy and it will be presented to the next planning committee, um, then, um, then that, that period can, could even be shorter, so that could even be three months. Councillor Spicer, do you have a point of order? It's, it's only a point of order, bearing in mind that Mr Barnum would be watching this on television. Um, it, will it come back to committee before approval is given? Because I'm now not clear at all whether it's delegated or if it is coming back to committee. No, it would only be that... Um, the officers would have the um, approval, but it would just be a report that came back to committee to say that the section 106 has been signed. So it will only be an information bulletin. The committee will not get to see it before they, as councillor, sorry, I mustn't enter the debate. The committee will not see the section 106 before it is signed off. Okay. You've, you've Um, members have seen the, the draft of it, which has yet to be signed, Councillor Spicer. So, in fact, it's the original recommendations, yeah. Just with a change of words. Yeah, well, we'll move on to the vote. All those in favour? Against? So that has been accepted, members. And now we'll move on to agenda item five, which is Holton St. Peter Primary School. I'd like to welcome, sorry. Could we have an adjournment for five minutes? I think uh, my, my officers just uh, need to take a comfort break himself. Yeah, if members, um, we've lost the officer, so we'll just have a five-minute break quickly. So if I see what, five minutes past 12, please.
members, I will be restarting the meeting shortly. Moving on to agenda item 5, Holton St Peter Primary School. I would like to welcome to the meeting Mark Barnard, Planning Officer, who will now introduce the report. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and uh, good, good afternoon. <laughs> Right, this is the proposal for County Council development. It's for a standalone building for 30 early years places at Holton St. Peter Primary School, which is close to Halesworth. Um, the school sits uh, on the corner of Beckles Road, um, the main road through the village, B Class Road, and Bungy Road um, in the angle, as you can see. Um, uh, Vehicular access into the school site is from Bungy Road um, and leads into a small car park. To the northwest of the school um, is the school playing field, um, and the proposed building, um, as you can see from the committee plan, would be on the edge of the playing field fronting Bungy Road. To the west and south of the playing field, you've got modern residential development. The school is within the village conservation area, which is shown on your committee plan. This just shows the air, air view. Um, you can see the playing field is fringed with trees uh, and it has a continuous hedge to Bungie Road. This just shows the existing layout. Um, the oval running track, which you can see marked on the plan, um, would be lost, but could be replaced in a different form if desired. <clears throat> As I said, the new building would sit behind the frontage hedge with only a small section of the hedge removed to form a, uh, a new pedestrian access. Another path would lead from the new building into the main school site. Um, at the rear of the new building, there would be a canopy, uh, the full width of the building, and a fenced, uh, hard and soft play space. All the existing trees on the site would be kept. The football pitch would be retained, and a straight running track would be formed. The building is in two distinct parts. Um, the main teaching space is faced in red brick, under a pitched slated roof. Uh, coming forward of that towards the road is a lower section uh, which would be timber clad under a flat roof with a blue engineering brick porch. Windows and faces and soffits would be in grey UPVC and there would be aluminium rainwater goods and canopy frame. It's quite a low building, uh, only 5.5 metres to the ridge. The forward section is set slightly into the rising ground on the site boundary. So there would still be views over the building towards the trees at the back of the playing field. There's a division between the main teaching space, um, which is in green, and ancillary spaces, which are ranged each side of an entrance corridor and as you can see from the roof plan, um, there is potential for PV cells on, on the flat roof. <coughs> Dr 
drainage, surface water drainage would be through sustainable means with a tanked permeable surfacing and pipe flows to a cellular soak away at the rear. <coughs> This is the size of the proposed building, just a piece of playing field. Um, it's looking towards the road and you can see the hedge from inside the site and the school car park is off to the left of the uh, photograph. This shows the Bungy Road frontage opposite church view which is in front of the camera. The new pedestrian gate would be sited between the lamp post and the telegraph pole and the school building on the corner of the site you can just about see um, above the white parked van this just shows the school car park <coughs> which is directly off the bungy road <coughs> Objections have been received on the grounds of inadequate parking and impacts of peak time school traffic, especially on Church View. Um, these have come from the Parish Council and four local residents. Turning to parking first, there are at least two spaces spare capacity in the existing school car park and two additional spaces will be formed by relocating the green shed that you can see in the photograph one parking space would be lost to form the path between the new building and the existing school site. The development has a requirement for four spaces, so in, the in theory there'd be a shortfall of one parking space. Um, and this can be mitigated by encouraging sustainable travel using a, a travel plan, which would be a condition of any approval. Um, the staff can also park in the nearby village hall car park by an informal agreement uh, with the school. Peak time traffic and parent parking affects Bungy Road and Church View. Um, there are parking restrictions on Beckles Road and on Bungy Road as far as the school entrance. They're both double yellow lines. Um, the applicant has agreed to fund uh, a traffic regulation order to introduce parking restrictions at peak times uh, at the junction of Bungy Road and Church View, as recommended by Suffolk County Council Highways. <clears throat> I consider this to be a reasonable and proportionate response which addresses the points made by local residents in their objections. A condition is proposed that the new building shall not be occupied until these new parking restrictions are, are in place. Otherwise, uh, Suffolk County Council highways do not object to the development. <clears throat> the other objection has come from Sport England um, because of the loss of what they see as an integral part of the playing field, contrary to national policy. Um, Sport England claim that the oval running track that you saw um, can, accom can uh, accommodate a the, the, the running track is 200 metres long, which is, which is wrong. It's not as long as they claim. Um, the marked track is, is, is much less than 200 uh, metres long and is a voluntary addition to the, to the field, as with primary schools normally just have a straight running track. However, a track of similar length, um, probably between 100 and 150 metres uh, to the existing, can be accommodated if required. Um, We've written to Sport England making these points, also making the point that Holton's field, the school field, is relatively large compared with the size of the school, which only has 110 pupils. We haven't heard back from Sport England. <coughs> there have been no other objections to the application, um, and the application is supported by East Suffolk Council and it's funded uh, through the community infrastructure levy, which is uh, generated by the District Council. Um, there have also been no objections from landscape or ecology or, or archaeology. There'd be no harm to the conservation area as the existing hedge and trees visible on Bungy Road would, would all stay, so the view would be preserved. All relevant planning policy is met and the proposals represent sustainable development for which 
planning permission is recommended to be granted. Thank you, Mark. Members, do you have any points of clarification? Councillor Beer? Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, yes, uh, I note the comments about the parking, um, but some of the objectors, in fact, I think most of them, uh, claim that the village hall, uh, it's, it's not practical. Do we know anything about that? I mean, we're suggesting that they use the village hall um, area to park in, and as we're uh, losing um, one parking space, we could live with that if they can use the village hall, but they say it's not convenient, and um, really they all disregard that. Do, do you know why it's not convenient? I think it's probably because it's about uh, two or three hundred metres up the road, and though there is a footpath uh, between the village hall site and the school, um, it's just the, the convenience of being able to park closer. That's the reason. Well, lots of places don't have that convenience, do they? So I think that's... Councillor Clake. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I am familiar, this is not in my ward, um, but I am familiar with the school uh, because I, I don't go to the school, but I go past there quite a lot. Um, I agree that there should be the um, parking restrictions in Church View, but then where are those cars going to go that used to park in Church View? Um, the village hall isn't that far away from the school, but I was wondering whether there could be further parking provision made at the school for parents dropping their children off because potentially you've got or actually picking them up because drop off tends to be staggered whereas picking up is always at the same time and whether there's a potential for using more of the playing field which i know isn't a popular <coughs> thought um, for parking or turning because to drive along bungie road or beckles road in holton at school pickup time is quite a nightmare thank you Yeah, that, that point has been made by a number of uh, the representations we've received. Um, I, I would say that the uh, issue about um, forming a new uh, drop-off or pick-up uh, lay-by on the playing field, that, that would have a detrimental effect on the uh, conservation area, I think, because you'll be losing quite a lot of hedge as well as uh, I increasing hard surfacing. And, and, and I think that... Uh, we would not wish to encourage that kind of approach when, when the, 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 the amount of shortfall is, is so small and it can be, it can be managed by, by other means. And it will be easy to try and encourage more parents or indeed more staff, but I think that the issue is parents really, to park in the, in the village hall car park because there is a, there is a footpath, you know, it's not as if you're walking along the road. So, but I think the, you know, all policy, uh, points us towards trying to encourage sustainable means of travel and I think by you know forming a, a, a lay-by which would be quite expensive to do it wouldn't really be proportionate to to the issue that's generated by by the amount of additional pupils we've got here. Councillor Stringer. Yeah just want to you mentioned the uh, this sort of shallow pitch of the of the roof do you know what degrees it is because slate should not go any less than 20 degrees so it, it will be it is a it is a i'm not sure what the pitch is it, it's probably about 15 or 20 degrees but it will be it will be a, a pitch suitable for for slate and, and i've made the point in the committee report that um I, i'd like to see a, a, a natural slate yeah. used because it will be the roof will be the most visible element from from the public domain, so I think yeah. it's quite important to get that get so, that right. So 20 degrees is normally the minimum. Some, well, yeah, you can you can see it on the, on yeah. the plans. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. It's not it's not excessive, but it's reasonable. Yeah, it's certainly not very flat. So yeah. No. Good. Thank you. Councillor Goldsmith. Yes, I'd like to make a comment on the travel plan, which is very interesting. You don't actually tell us what the travel plan is going to be, which seems to be a problem with most planning applications. Um, it would be nice to see what they've got in mind for their travel plan. Also, where you're going to have electric points, which is in the report, will those bays be only for electric cars or will they be generally used for, for the car park? 
you know, I, I don't know whether we can ever manage exactly who parks in EV points. Obviously, if, if, no, if none of the staff have, have electric vehicles, then uh, uh, it would be unreasonable for them not to park in those, in those places. It's, it's a bit of future-proofing, really. It's something which, um, because the car park is, is part of the application site, then, then highways have, have insisted upon that. But uh, um, I'm not sure we can go much further really. As far as the travel plan is concerned, yeah, we do have issues with getting travel plans uh, prepared and, and, and fully uh, um, you know, of an appropriate standard, but that's something we just have to, we just have to work to because there doesn't seem to be any obvious other way of encouraging schools to, to, uh, uh, to take the, the, the sustainable travel um, policy seriously. Members, do you have any further points of clarification? No, that brings us on to the public participation session and we have one request to speak on this item. I would like to introduce a supporter of the application speaking on behalf of the applicant, Ms Christine Starkle. To come forward to the public speaking table, turn your microphone on and you have five minutes to address the committee when you're ready. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. I'm very excited to be here. My name's Christine Starkle. I'm the head teacher of Holton St Peter and have been for the last six years and have a real passion for early years education. That's why I'm in this business, to make sure that our children of Halesworth and Holton and actually surrounding areas, because a lot of my children do come from surrounding areas, I want to make sure that they have the best possible quality provision that we can absolutely offer at Holton St Peter and I'd like to say that we had a, a very good um, offset inspection in October of last year um, and I'm, I'm really really proud of that fact so this is going to really um, promote um, early years education for the children at Holton so ad adding on from what Mark has already said um, Yes, we have had a couple of um, complaints um, and concerns from, local, from the local um, parish council and from um, a few residents in the area. Um, however, um, we've listened to these concerns and we've discussed them with um, Suffolk Highways. And as a result, we have submitted um, a letter of intent outlining that the application to the traffic restriction order will be applied for. The school has already got, we take in 15 children um, every year into our reception class, but three years ago, we actually took in an additional 11 children into our reception class. So we do actually have a nursery. So this application is actually asking us to say, can we have our own building for those 11 children? And then that means we can then up the numbers, which will really, really support um, what's going on at Holton St. Peter. Um, so these 11 children will just be transferred into that nursery building. Um, and interestingly enough, um, it hasn't added a problem to the parking at all, because lots of those children have siblings in the school anyway. So last year, I took 15 children into my year one. Nine of those children were already in our, sorry, into reception. Nine of those children were already at the school. So the nursery will accommodate children um, from the nearby housing, from, in, sorry. The nursery will accommodate children arising from the nearby housing development. Edgar Suter Primary School, which is just up the road from us in Halesworth, has actually expanded. Um, and pupils at Halesworth, are, they're moving around and actually going from Halesworth. Some of them live in Holton, so we would like those children to be able to come to Holton School. I think as the head teacher at Holton, that what we would actually be doing is reducing the traffic because we are sending children at the moment that live in Halesworth and Holton up to Edgar Suter, whereas these children would now actually be able to walk to school. As already mentioned, we do have um, an agreement with the village hall for parking. 
And it has actually worked really well, particularly throughout the COVID time. That's when we asked all of our parents and all of our staff to be able to park up at the village hall and walk for two minutes down the road to get into the school. And it worked really well. And the village hall have kindly said, you can absolutely carry on that, that provision. Um, so we're really happy to do that. Um, as far as a travel plan is concerned, we have submitted a travel plan and it is actually with the local authority as we speak. There are a number of staff that I have that are local to Holton. So they actually do walk to school. So when you see a picture of our car park, you will see that there's two or three parking spaces that are free every day because they are walking or cycling into school. Um, to support the environmental sustainability um, and to encourage pupils to be more active, we are actually working on that plan working with the children, working with the staff to actually get them to be more physical and to actually walk to school because there's no reason why we can't do that for the children that actually live in Holton and Halesworth. Our, our original plan did overlook um, the um, EV charging points but we've re we have now rectified this. Um, provision within the project will be made for two EV chargers but at this precise moment in time, we actually don't have any staff that actually drive electric cars. So, Thank oh, my, you. My so sorry, that's your time. <laughs> We're going to have to stop you there. Um, members, do you have any points of clarification? Councillor Beer? Um, well, I was going to ask about the, um, the two additional spare spaces, but you've already answered that in your uh, um, statement. Um, but uh, number three on our paper here, objections received from Parish Council, one local resident raise, raises issues of excessive noise. Well, what do you expect at a school? Well, I live near a school and uh, <laughs> I think lots of other members do. Um, so really, you're not experiencing anything different than what any other of the schools do. And if you can uh, encourage your staff to cycle walk, that's better because you've got the spaces. Disappointed that you're losing one, but I do understand, I've heard what um, Mr. Barnard says, and uh, so I'm quite happy. Thank you. Thank you. Members, do you have any further points of clarification? No. Thank you very much, Ms. Starkle, for your time. I will now you. open the debate. Councillor Stringer. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Uh, just want to start off by saying uh, this is a really good balanced report, actually. <laughs> it's one of the easiest ones I've had to read in a long time. So thank you for a really good balanced report. And actually taking on the challenges and the shortfalls just head on and just saying, well, yeah, there is a loss of a parking space, sort of, you know. Uh, but also pleased to see that there are uh, parking restrictions that will come out of this. We, we've had a similar facility built in, in Backton many years ago. Uh, and it was an absolute boost to educational attainment, community cohesion, uh, and some of the outcomes. Yes, it did put a bit more of a burden on parking, and we had to then introduce parking restrictions after that. Glad to see this is one of the conditions in here. Uh, and, and traffic, I think, is, is not going to go away, or it will change. It will be a challenge, uh, but it's one of the going to be the challenges of our age. Uh, I have no hesitation in moving approval on, on this application as per the officer's recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Stringer. We have a proposer. Councillor Beer, are you happy to second? I'm very pleased to second it. And as um, uh, sort of more of a friend of the motorists, I do agree with you wholeheartedly that they have to play their part. And um, certainly, if the restrictions help, um, then they should be put in place. I've had to have them in my schools in my area. And uh, at the end of the day, um, this is a way forward with the schools and the parents trying to work together, and we should encourage it. Thank you. Councillor Drummond. I was happy to second. Thank you. Councillor Bryce. Really just to add in support of Councillor Stringer's comments, early years provision is such an important part um, across Suffolk and increasing that provision I think is, is laudable and the sustainable travel efforts that have been made by the provider I think and that have been taken into account in this balance report again so I'm very happy to support the recommendations put forward. Thank you. I see no further hands. 
So we have a proposal by Councillor Stringer, which is seconded by Councillor Beer, and that's the officer recommendation be approved subject to the application not being called in for a decision by the Secretary of State or after the expiry of 21 days from acknowledgement of receipt of the application by the Secretary of State. Planning permission is granted subject to the conditions set out in Appendix A of this report. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, members. That brings us on to the final agenda item, item six, which is the claim public footpath, Butts Road to Church Road, Playford. And I would like to welcome to the meeting David Last, the definitive map officer, who will now give you the report. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay, this is a formal application made by Playford Parish Council to record a public footpath. Um, trying to find the pointer. There we go. Uh, on map two, the claimed public footpath is between points A and B, between Butts Road and Church Road. Um, it was a formal application that was made in 2016. As the County Council hadn't determined it within the year, um, the applicant has the right to seek a direction from the Secretary of State, which they did a few years later, and we were directed in a lesser date of the 26th of April 2022 to determine it by the 27th of April 23, so we're within time of that. Uh, it's a formal application that was supported by eight user evidence forms, um, and also as a matter of course, documentary evidence is researched into to see if there's anything else that will support the, the application. As it turns out, the only documentary evidence is the audience survey maps, and as the report states, they can't be, be taken to show public rights or private rights. Come to that, they're just purely a physical depiction. So there isn't any um, documentary evidence to support public rights. On the analysis of the user evidence, um, we have to look at a 20-year period from when the public's right to use the route has been brought into question. And the earliest date that can be established for that is 2016, when this formal application was made. So we're looking at a period 26, for 20 years, sorry, up to 20, 2016. <coughs> of the eight that were supplied, only three actually fall within that strict 20 years usage, usage period. And unfortunately, the usage stated is very occasional. It's, it's not regular or... or um, in, intense use of the route by any means. Common law can also be looked at if 20 years can't be met, but that relies on the use, to be, the use being intensive use and acquiescence by the landowner. Well, the user forms show it hasn't been intensive use, and the landowners don't claim to have seen anybody using it during that time anyway. As the first paragraph of the report points out, this matter has to be decided purely based on the evidence Unfortunately, things like the need for it, or wish for it, or even public safety to keep them off the roads can't be taken into account. So the recommendation is that the application be rejected and that all parties are advised accordingly. Thank you, Mark. Oh, sorry, David. Um, members, do you have any points of clarification? Councillor Goldsmith? Yes. Um, if we look at page 166, paragraph 57, it says that at common law there is no requirement that 20 years use be shown, but you've mentioned that you use 20 years. So is, does it have to be 20 years or not? Right, okay, I, I did explain that. Maybe I didn't get it over clear enough. 20 years use is to satisfy the Highways Act, which show 20 years use up to the date of challenge. Under common law, which is different to the Highways Act, you can show that use has been attained by lesser periods if it's been open, intense, and it can be shown that the landowner has acquiesced in that use. They've allowed it. They've maybe seen people on the route and said, good morning or whatever. They've witnessed the use, allowed it, acquiesced in it. So that can happen on less than 20 years. There isn't really a set number of years for it. But so in this case, that doesn't apply either the Highways Act or the Common Law. If I can come back. 
Um, also on a report, which I can't find in front of me at the moment, it mentioned about a previous owner, when he farmed the land, leaving a gap between the crops for the people to walk through there. But that indicates to me that he recognised it was a footpath. Uh, I don't think it says in there that he left a gap. There was a, a change in crop, um, what, what was cropped either side of the route, which may have made it look like a, a line across the, across the field, but there was no actual mention of leaving a gap. Whether there's a slight variance between the crops is a possibility, but I, I don't believe there's any particular mention of leaving a path mm. across there. That's it, all done. Councillor Drummond. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's just really a, a, a question about the timings. On, on 159 at 2, it says there was a formal application dated the 18th of October 2016, which is six, seven years ago. <laughs> it just seems to, for these things to take so long, and I just wondered if we could have a comment as to, to why that is the case. Thank you. I'm afraid that is a, a common problem, that there are literally hundreds of these applications with the County Council, and it's a matter of resource to get them looked at. So when they came in, come in, they're scored by a panel of managers as to on various things, benefit to the public, benefit to the public net, to the network, strength of evidence, various things, and the higher their score, they move up the list faster than when they were just received. So it does, it does often happen the fact that some reports can constantly get leapfrogged because others score above it. That's why there is the opportunity for applicants to appeal to the Secretary of State to say, we want our application determined, which in this case they did, and that's what we're now doing. Thank you. Councillor Sower. Um, thank you very much. Um, I don't understand really why you say there shouldn't be a public footpath, because not having a public footpath is like Councillor um, Smith said, Gosmith said, that it's, um, the danger is that everybody just walks around and it, it's, it's, it's unsafe and, and it's, it's not coordinated. And um, in the end, a public footpath would be sort of much better or not. I don't understand why you object. Uh, it, <coughs> it's all down to the, the legislation under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. This is, we're not looking to, this process doesn't look to create new public rights of way. What it is, people can make a formal application that they believe something already is a public right of way, it's just not officially recorded as such. And to do, and to, to then record it, to say, yes, we recognise it is a public footpath and has been, even though not recorded, that has to be based on evidence. Documentary evidence, evidence of use. It can't be wishes or, as mentioned earlier, safety, that can't come into it either. It has to be documentary evidence or user evidence, combination of both. And unfortunately in this case, there isn't the evidence to support it, so we can't make a recommendation to add a for public footpath. I hope that helps. Are there any further points of clarification, members? Councillor Harson? So, um, David, if we support the recommendation, um, that's fine, but if we voted that it should become a public footpath, in other words, vote against the recommendation, what happens then? Okay, well, the two scenarios, if you voted in favour of the recommendation to reject, the applicant does still have the right of appeal to the Secretary of State to get them to look at it as well, which the Secretary of State could then throw it out or could tell the County Council to make the order if they thought the evidence was strong enough. If this committee makes the alternate decision of the recommendation, then yes, the order's made, because that's what the committee has um, determined. It has to be based on evidence, so the committee would have to be sure that they say that the evidence supports there being a public right of way. Not that it would be a good idea, but that the evidence supports it. And if that was the case, the order would be made, it would be advertised, and it would most definitely be objected to, because the landowner has got legal representation just at the consultation stage. Most people wait until public inquiry, so it would go to a public inquiry um, for an inspector to determine. If they determined in favour of the council, then it gets recorded. If they determined that it, should be re that it shouldn't be recorded, then obviously they, they don't um, determine the they don't confirm the order, and it does also leave the council open to the possibility of costs for making the order when really perhaps they shouldn't have done. 
Are there any further points of clarification, members? No, that brings us on to the public participation, and I would like to invite the representative from Playford Parish Council, Mrs Joanne Metcalf, to come forward to the public speaking table, turn your microphone on, and you have five minutes to address the committee. Good afternoon. My name is Joan Metcalf, and I'm chairman of Playford Parish Council. Playford Parish Council have been attempting to reinstate this footpath between Butts Road and Playford Church for the last 40 or more years. I understand that David Last has recommended the application be rejected, but I hope that the committee will be open to a counter-argument and will have read my emails replying to Mr Last's observations. Playford was historically part of the Marquis of Bristol's estate, and until 1950, all the farmland surrounding the village was still owned by the estate. It was then that Charles Lofts leased and later bought the land from the estate and kept cattle in the field alongside the footpath in question. We have a letter dated the 31st of January 1960 from Violet Evans of Meadow Cottage to the Parish Council complaining about mud on the footpath due to the feed for the cows being put down along the footpath. She also complains about a bull being loose in the field. So the footpath was certainly in use then. In the 80s, there was a definitive match review of the footpaths, and at the time, the parish council tried to reinstate it, but Mr Lofts refused to support the proposal. He was a parish councillor at the time, and quite how he managed to persuade the other councillors not to carry the application forward, I have no idea but I understand he could get fairly aggressive with people who didn't agree with him. As I have said, there can be no doubt that this footpath existed. There is plenty of evidence from the various maps dating back to 1884, and as late as October this year, East Suffolk Council added a footpath map to its website showing the, math, the path in question. Prior to the introduction of motorised transport, movement between the villages would have been primarily on foot using the shortest routes possible. And it is very logical to assume, therefore, that this footpath has existed for hundreds of years. A footpath which originates in Colfo comes across the fields to join FP3 on the parish boundary and then meets up with FP25 on Branson's Lane. This lane runs up to Butts Road and would meet a few yards down, from, down along Butts Road with the footpath in question. If the route of the said footpath is followed, it would meet Church Road just close to the east entrance of the churchyard. If continued, there is a choice of FP8 to Little Beelings or FP5 to Great Beelings. In short, this footpath is a missing link in a system of footpaths joining the villages and churches. For the first 15 years after we moved into Playford, we had a dog which I walked frequently across the footpath in question. At the time, the path was a dividing line between two crops, so although Mr Lofts refused to define the path in any way, it was relatively easy, although sometimes a little muddy, to walk. When the, first, uh, when the parish council first made the application in 2016, there were several villagers who remembered walking the path. Sadly, some of these have died and some have moved out of the village, or, though I understand that David Lust has managed to contact some of these. In 1996, Charles Love sold this land, to, a part of his land, to Mr Parkin, who has never recognised that the path exists. Whether this was glossed over during the sale or perhaps it was regarded as being insignificant, I don't know. As the footpath sh is shown on all recent OS footpath maps, some people continue to use the path, although with great difficulty, as it is ploughed and sown, and without footpath sign, many walkers would be reluctant to walk on farmed land. We're not asking much of Mr Parkin. Some of the footpaths around footpaths have their routes defined by a tractor track, so the definition of the path is not difficult. This footpath is not very long, and there are no other major obstacles, no need for fences or stiles, just a footpath sign at each end. Reinstating the path would link all the said footpaths together, and although I understand it is not a consideration in this process, 
it would be much safer for people to use than having to walk down Butts Road, which is narrow and twisty, running at the risk of running, being run down by a speeding car. The Finn Valley has increasingly become a favoured walking venue for Kesgrave and Ipswich. Reinstating this footpath would give walkers a safe and interesting route around the Finn and Mark Valley villages as, with very little outlay. I'm sure it would not overly inconvenience Mr Parkin and would greatly add to the enjoyment of many, many walkers. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs Metcalf. Members, do you seek any points of clarification? Councillor Kemp. Right, thank you, Madam. Uh, in your uh, resume, you said that the Parish Council had been making representations over 40 years. I appreciate you've lived there 16 years. <laughs> do, do you have any written evidence, or is there any written evidence of those efforts made by the Parish Council, please? Other than just the odd reference in a minutes, but nothing of any substance, I'm afraid. So just to clarify, there's no letters being written, as far as you know, not within the, the 40 not that we years? Have, not that we have found, no. Okay, thank you. Are there any other members that would seek clarification? No, thank you very much, Mrs Metcalf, for your time. I'd like to invite Councillor Bryce, local councillor for the Carlford Division, to turn your microphone on and you have five minutes to address the committee when you're ready. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, as we've heard from Parish Chairman um, Councillor Joe Metcalf, Playford Parish submitted their reinstatement request in 2016 and this was escalated to the Secretary of State. It's an issue that I've long been aware of in, in representing local residents and attending the Parish Council meetings in, in Playford. As we've heard, the landowner contests the path and doesn't maintain it or keep it clear or usable. So whilst I've only been the local county councillor since 2021, um, I have been local to the area for over 20 years and know that this footpath is well used, well supported, and it's a very highly valued local amenity which supports the well-being and the mental health of local residents. As it's been a footpath unbeat unrecognised by the landowner and in a perilous condition currently, there is evidence, as we've heard, as far back as 1960 from a resident who wrote that the footpath was in use then, and according to definitive maps, I believe as far back as the 1800s, it does appear that the local landowner is the issue that is why the footpath is not currently recognised as such. In October 2022, we've heard the East Suffolk Council added this very footpath that we're talking about today to its website, showing the footpath between Butts Road and Playford Church. And the footpath is shown on current Ordnance Survey maps. Butts Road, as the local member, is a quite a fast moving road. Um, I, for one, wouldn't really like to walk down there, particularly if I had young children with me. Um, myself, I struggle with balance due to a disability and I would not feel safe walking down the road there. In terms of wider use of the footpath, there is a well-established local walking group, the Finn Valley Walking Group. Walking has boomed since COVID. People have recognised the benefits to their mental health and well-being of getting out in the fresh air, Kesgrave, in such lo local proximity, close proximity rather, to Playford benefit from the network of footpaths around there. In terms of healthy outcomes, we have aspirations in Suffolk to be the most active county, so in my mind the failure to reinstate this footpath flies in the face of those aspirations. Indeed, we heard in the earlier representations relating to the early years provision at Holton, talking about active travel and encouraging walking in our local communities. Again, the failure to reinstate this footpath seems to fly in the face of those aspirations to encourage um, more active travel. Sorry, I've just covered my last point. I was just making sure I'd not duplicated it. Um, the final question I had in term, a question or a comment, if I'm allowed to make it, Madam Chair, is in terms of evidence of local use of that footpath. It may be in the paper and I've not seen it, but I'd like to understand a little better and appreciate I may not be allowed to have that answer as part of committee hearing this morning but how that evidence is actually assumed or collated 
um, because in my mind there is plenty of evidence of the footpath being used and of local residents enjoying that footpath. It's more a case of the footpath being obstructed from regular use. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. Members, do you have any points of clarification? Councillor Drummond? No? Councillor Beer? Um, you, you stated in, in your statement that um, there's a local walk-on uh, club. Um, do you know whether they have put in any um, requests to, about this path or evidence? Because um, the fact that we'd like to have it reinstated isn't evidence. Isn't evidence. Um, so what's your view on that? Thank you. I'm not aware of formal representations that they may have um, put in or otherwise. I'm aware from speaking to them at parish councils and at community events that they do enjoy the network of footpaths locally, but I do understand that the local community and parish were taken slightly aback at the timing of this coming forward to this committee this morning, so whether they may have had sufficient notice to put forward any representations, I couldn't comment on clearly. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just to pick up on a couple of points there, um, local walking groups, as part of the standard consultations, um, we consult with the local area representative rep for the um, Ramblers Association, so the local rep that covers Playford would have been consulted, haven't had any response um, from them. Um, so I'll answer that one. Just go back to an earlier point about appearing on recent maps, like for the district council as a footpath. Virtually all maps that go onto OS maps published or on, onto, onto organisations' websites, they rely on a base OS map. And these physical features, as referred to in the report, still appear on a lot of these maps. They won't, won't appear on those maps as a public footpath if you look at the key or anything, because I think on most um, ordnance sort of a explorer of maps which do show public rights away, they probably use the green lines over the top of the base map. Base mapping is purely physically what, at the time of the survey, was the survey observed or believed to be there, and can't be taken as public or private, which so the report does say. And for definitive maps showing public rights, they've only been in existence since the 1950s. That's where we have to look to see what other evidence points towards something being public. Those maps, going back to 1884, are the OAS, which say they've got the disclaimer that they can't show what the status is. If there's any points I've missed there, then please remind me. Councillor Kemp. Yeah. Could I, through you, Madam Chairman, uh, ask Mr. Last, if we choose to go the recommendation way today, is there any further redress, or whatever you like to call it, that the footpath users of this particular parish have? Is there any other <coughs> instrument they can bring in to play to try and get this path properly recognised? Uh, yes, as I mentioned earlier, this process does allow various things at various stages. Um, under where it says action recommended, um, reject with all parties being advised accordingly. Well, the communications that go to the applicant will have on there the, the details and the address of who the appeal, uh, appeal can be made to for the Secretary of State. It's actually um, farmed out to the planning inspector, but they do it on behalf of the Secretary of State. So, yes, that is the next course of action for the applicant. If, they, if, it, if it was rejected here today, they have the, the course of action they can appeal to the Secretary of State. Um, put forward what they have, and there's nothing stopping them putting more with it, because if, if they wish to, because they, oh, there's, there's another point I didn't pick up on it, the user evidence how it's collated. Um, when this form application was made in 2016, it was supported by eight user evidence forms, the forms that asked various questions about how often you used it, when you used it, what you used it for, those sort of things to establish people's use. Um, that's been analysed in tabular form at the back of the report, and the users that I managed to contact, it's in bold print, um, where I've confirmed information with them, where I've contacted them afterwards. In this case, it was mainly by email. Sometimes it's by phone call. Pre-COVID, we used to go out and see people face to face, but maybe we'll get back to that soon. But in whatever it is, um, various people have been contacted about their use. And from when this was made in 2016, those use, eight user evidence forms have gone through the process with it. 
consultation, I think, was the beginning of September this year. There was nothing stopping more coming in. Um, but we can only judge on what we have before us. So, say, no documentary evidence, because OS can't really count as public, public status, and the user evidence is just insufficient. Members, do you have any other points of clarification to Councillor Bryce, Councillor Stringer? Yeah, I, excuse me if I'm being dim, uh, but I was always led to, whenever I get an inquiry about footpaths, I always refer people to the definitive map. It's shown on the definitive map. Well, I've just looked it up, it is. I don't think you'll find there's a, a public footpath on the definitive map with a number to it and a, and a description in the statement. No, there's, I agree. There's no number, but it clearly says path. Uh, and so if I was an ordinary member of the public, or as in my role, if I were the county councillor of Blayford, uh, I would be directing the public to our website, and it says, it's a path. Well, if it looks like a path, and you can walk it like a path, it's probably a path. Yes, that's unfortunate. The, the OS-based mapping it, to the surveyor it, it, at the time, it looked like a path, so it's labelled path. Sometimes you'll have things labelled FP or BR, for, short for right of way, but unless it's on the definitive map as a public right of way, they're just, just definitions of how it appeared to the, the surveyor. They don't carry any weight as to whether it's a public path or a private path. Many paths historically used to cross fields for the farm workers to get to the fields. They weren't public paths. The farm workers would use them to get to the fields. So it's, whilst you look at the definitive map, you may see a line. That's base mapping of the Ordnance Survey onto which the definitive lines are put. Let me just pop on this. So people then saying they have used it is not evidence or not sufficient evidence. And parish council records saying that it's been blocked is also not records because it's, it's too, up, too old. It seems to be this magic 20-year window that any evidence before that is not acceptable. But if there's not sufficient evidence within the window, then that's, it seems very confusing. Everything has, has to be... Uh, one of people t saying, two people saying they've used something can't make something a public right away over, over people's land. That has to be sufficient evidence. The 20 year use is to satisfy use within that dedication period as laid down by the Highways Act. It doesn't mean anything before 20 years is of no value. That's where common law can come into, into play if there's been open and intensive use of the route. But it hasn't been shown that there has been. With, the user evidence has been analysed and this very infrequent occasional use is all that can, can be shown from the user evidence that's been supplied. Councillor Sower? Uh, I'm even more confused than before. Why are you objecting it to be a public footpath? I'm asking this question again because we just heard that walking groups use it. It's actually on a map like a path. Um, I mean, um, we heard the statement from the parish chair, I believe, and, and I mean, it, it, there seems to be a lot of evidence that this path is actually used heavily by the public. Why do you object having it turned into a public footpath, please? Okay, that, that is just the point. It's evidence that isn't this strong uh, uh, amount of evidence. Um, the, the map that's shown on is a physical depiction on Ordnance Survey maps. They don't show public rights of way. There's a line there. People's driveways, if you've got a long driveway to your house, that will show on Ordnance Survey maps, but it's not a footpath. <laughs> so um, the evidence has to be evidence of it being having a public status, not just that it exists or has exist, existed. I mean, at the moment, it doesn't. It's a, it's a crop frill right th throughout. Um, it has to be evidence of public status, not just of existing. And with the mention of public wa of walking groups using it, I consulted with the walking groups. They didn't respond. They obviously didn't have anything else to add to it. I mean, there's been nothing else added to it since the eight user evidence forms, which was submitted in 2016. Um, okay. May I ask you then to change the recommendations in as specific as in being more specific what you would like to see as evidence? Because I can't see us. The county's um, duties is not to go out and seek the evidence to record right away. The public have a right to make a formal application to, record, to ask for something recorded that they believe is. 
our job was, well, my job was looking at the evidence is to sit on the fence and, and analyse that evidence as to whether that is sufficient to record a public right away or not. I'd be being biased if I went out trying to push and find extras. Uh, I'll do the most I can to make sure I see what evidence is available. I look at what's sent in and I trawl the records office to see anything documentary wise. So it's not a case of what I'd like to see to record it, it's what there is in front of me. I have to say, is it sufficient or not? The, the application is to record it, so I have to look at the evidence. Is the evidence sufficient to record it or not? And balancing it up, if, if you take, take a set of scales that weight for and against, it doesn't tip in favour, unfortunately, because there's just not enough weighty evidence to show that the public have used it for a long time. To, um, or, or documentary-wise, it's just got, uh, in this case, hasn't got much going for it, unfortunately. Councillor Harson, am I still allowed to ask Councillor Bryce a question? You, you said at the beginning of your presentation that there was um, a delay with the parish council receiving this information. Could, could you explain that a little bit more and whether that in itself is evidence that um, um, we need to take into account? Thank you, Councillor Harsant. Um, it is my understanding from um, discussions with the Parish Council and with the, the Parish Clerk that it came very late in the day. Um, I had an email dated 7th of December, just last week, to say that the issue has become, despite it being raised in 2016, and this going to the Secretary of State, that it has, quote, become extremely urgent, as we have found out, out of the blue, the hearing is on Thursday the 15th at Endeavour House. If that answers your question, thank you. So surely that in itself doesn't give time for the parish council to... Uh, if, if I can pick up there. When, obviously this application was made in 2016, but when it lands on my desk for an active investigation, I do a full consult, I consult all parties, landowners, applicant, parish council, county councillor, and all these consultations were sent out on the 1st of September. When they asked for a month for anything to be any responses to that consultation to be with me within 28 days. Um, there was some responses that were included within the report. And then after that, it, the draft report was sent out. I haven't got the exact date when the draft report was sent out, but it would have been after that four weeks consultation and obviously earlier than the, the date of when it was notified attending this meeting. The draft report went out for all parties to view and comment on, and there are comments included within the report from the, the, the consult. When the draft of the report was sent out for comments, if I do somewhere in the report, bear with me. Paragraph 36 onwards, comments received post circulation of the draft report. There I've got the responses from Burkett's solicitors acting for the landowner and the email from Joe Metcalf from the parish council. And then later on, there was contact from, from a councillor, Hedgley, uh, district council. That was following the draft report. I say it's not a case of it was maybe on the seventh that it was notified that the meeting was happening, but that date was actually on the draft report as well, which was sent out somewhat earlier. Members, do you have any further points of clarifications from Councillor Bryce, Councillor Goldsmith? Um, Peter. It's just to, to qualify something. Yeah, that's fine. Um, on section 51, paragraph 51, it states, if the county council makes an order based on the lower test and objections are received, it will take a neutral stance and not support the order of the inquiry stage. Which seems a bit strange to me because if the county council makes the order, which has been instructed from by elected members, are we not? the county council and not the officers. Right, the, the, <coughs> excuse me, the paragraph you picked up there is following the, the tests for considering documentary evidence, um, how strong we believe the documentary evidence is. Um, paragraphs 49, um, 15 on to 51 deal with that. You've got two tests, you've got the balance of probability tests. If you've got documentary evidence, you're weighing it up. It's the, the set of scales again, the balance. Where does it tip, in favour or against? 51% in favour. That satisfies the balance of probabilities test. That is the, the higher test of the two. And if the council looked at the documentary evidence and said, yes, it meets that higher test, it's good, strong documentary evidence, 
then the order would be made and the county council would support that order at a public inquiry if it was opposed. If we looked at the documentary evidence, which I have to go back to the fact that there isn't any in this case, but if there were, if we went back to the documentary evidence and thought, there's a bit there, but it's not really strong, it might be enough, we would say it's reasonable to allege that it satisfies the test for um, the documentary test. And in which case, when it goes to public inquiry, if it's opposed to, when it gets to public inquiry, it has to meet that higher test. And the inspector who's looking at it has to be sure that it meets that higher test. If we've put it through saying, we think it only just gets through at a lower level, we can't then suddenly change our mind and say, oh yes, it does meet the higher test when we get to the public inquiry. So all we can do is go along on a neutral stance. We've made it on the low, lower test because the legislation states if it meets that lower test, we have to make an order. But if it's opposed, we, haven't really, we can't really fight for it that much because we didn't ourselves think it met that higher test, but it met the test for order making, which would be really fine if there's no objection. You can make an order based on the lower test. If nobody opposes it, then the order's confirmed. But, um, so that's what the two tests are. That's why if, based on documentary, we thought it met a lower test, we wouldn't then support it at a public inquiry. We wouldn't oppose it either. We'd purely be neutral mm. because we said it meets the lower one, but we didn't consider at the time of considering it, it meets the higher test for confirmation. So, so basically you should state the facts at the meeting, at the inquiry? Um, yes, uh, at a neutral public inquiry, I'd probably do very little more than say the process of when it was, what, what we did um, would be neutral, we wouldn't present evidence, that would have to come down to an applicant to press the case to say that it met the, the higher test and obviously the objectives would be argued that it didn't meet any. Are there any further members that would seek clarification? No? That then brings us on to debate. <coughs> Councillor Drummond. Thank you very much. Sorry I put my hand up a bit early before. Um, I feel that the evidence I see before me here and what we've heard today, that I would actually um, not reject this. I feel that rejection is not taking a neutral stance at all. And I would propose that we actually accept this part. Councillor Drummond, can you confirm yeah. the reasons, please? Could we have a material okay, well, reason I, for your I, objection? I, I think, um, you know, um, from what I've heard from Councillor Bryce, what I've heard from um, the uh, Playford um, Parish Councillor, and ha having gone through, um, you know, looking at the evidence, a long time has passed. I mean, this should have been before us much sooner than this. Six years have gone by. And, you know, I can imagine why people have lost the will to live to pursue it. Um, I feel that, um, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at where it's refuted by the landowner and his employees, of course they're going to do that. So, you know, it's, I, I am, I just feel that there's enough evidence that this is a path that's been used over a number of years, um, historically, uh, probably some attempts to extinguish it, but on the balance of probability, I think as a path. Like to support that too, Chair. Is that a second, Councillor Hassan? Thank you. Councillor Stringer? Yeah. I did, it's a question now to the officer because uh, there's a little bit of information that I, I've just looked up. Do we look at the evidence uh, and weigh up whether it's sufficient or not based on the amount of population? So therefore, would the number of people coming forward, I mentioned Bacton earlier, uh, Bacton is sort of 1,200, 1,300 people, would we assume that eight or nine people coming forward was insufficient there? Or is it insufficient in Play Playford when there's only 215 people there? And that's a very, very small population. So I would have thought on balance of probability, the, the chances of finding more than a handful of people is going to be a, a lot higher. So I, I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of balancing it where, where it's gone the other way, where I represent a village that's had an order upheld on the, on the basis of one person's memory of 40 years ago of using a bath, and it's been upheld. 
despite the path running right through the middle of someone's house. Uh, uh, I, I, I just can't quite balance out. You know, do, do we use the population th versus the amount of evidence uh, on a pro rata basis? Right. Obviously, I don't know the case you're talking about with one person's recollection, but I would imagine there must have been documentary evidence behind that as well as one person's recollection, because so I very much... I've never put a fraud report or seen one from my colleagues where it's been recommended based on one person's recollection. That would be, if that was user only, no documentary, that would well and truly be insufficient. And when we're talking about sufficient evidence, it's not a case of, it's not necessarily always the numbers or population size. No, we don't take any notice of the population size. It's who've put themselves forward to give evidence about a public right of way. Um, in this case, it was eight users. And of those eight, if all eight had used it daily, weekly, for many, many years, that'd be very strong evidence. Um, even if not all eight of them, I mean, as a rule of thumb, we quite often look at, if you've got four really good, strong user, users who've used it regularly for 20 years or even other, other periods, and they've used it weekly or daily on a regular basis, that is strong user evidence. If you look at the summary of the appendix we've got here, the use is occasional. Um, infrequent from time to time uh, at the best and only three of them fall within that 20 years period so three users maybe if they'd have been very strong users regular use for a long period it might have pushed it towards the four where would users say that'd be enough but three and it's irregular for infrequent use it, that's where it becomes insufficient it's not the number of users it's the amount of use they've, they've used the route is, is where, where it's considered insufficient. So eight people filling in forms, that's not where it's considered insufficient. It's when you analyse them, the actual evidence of use from those eight is where it falls as insufficient, unfortunately. Can I just... I mean, I, I personally would see that evidence over the 10-year period of the different crops delineating that you're quite significant. Farmers don't normally go out of their way to make their life awkward. Uh, and, and putting different crops in, in what is one field is, is making your life awkward, frankly. Uh, even in the 70s, the machinery was still pretty big. So I, 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 I'm just sort of, sort of you know, looking at, at that as, as you know, how much weight that's given. I mean, the farming principles, that's, that's really got to come down to, I'm not a farmer, so I mean, that must come down to the farmer. If he's got a certain bit of land, if he does one crop, two crops, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be able to make any judgment on that. The previous landowner that seemed to, from the, what's been documented, did two crops. The current landowner does one crop right through. Um, I can only imagine that's down to the farmer's choice. And that if there was anything in it, say it's not really evidence unless it clearly provided a footpath and acquiesced in making this footpath available across the middle there, then that would be different, but we haven't got the evidence to say he has. I mean, the attempts of when people have tried to use it, they've said it's been near impassable and extremely muddy, so it's not really been made available for anybody, from what the evidence shows. Are there any other members that would like to enter the debate? So we have a proposal and a seconder that it is recommended that the formal application is approved with all the parties being advised accordingly. That was proposed by Councillor Drummond and seconded by Councillor Harsant. All those in favour? Against? Can I just have the against again, please? Three, thank you. So that application is approved. Thank you for everyone for your attendance and contributions today. Can I take this opportunity to wish you a happy and peaceful festive season? Before you go, the next meeting of the Development and Regulation Committee is scheduled to be held at 10 o'clock on Wednesday, the 1st of February. The next site inspection reserve date for planning matters is scheduled for the morning of Friday the 27th of January. Please ensure that you take cups, glasses, rubbish, paperwork and personal belongings with you. This meeting is now closed. <laughs>